Hey guys, welcome to Alt Swift X talking Raised by Wolves, Season 2, Episode 5, titled King. Uh, what an episode! I, I It sort of lulled me into a false sense of security because, like, the first half of the episode was, like, pretty slow, and then it just suddenly turned into a horror movie with Sue and the slugs and then the and then and then the, the the beach and the monster and and then uh Marcus went down the pit and then fucking evil robot child comes to to take vengeance uh, against humanity for the crimes committed against robot kind we went like we we went like skynet we went like terminator junior this is like a little baby terminator coming to wreak revenge and uh my god and then like and then uh and then paul is is not a snake they unsnakeified paul somehow with leeches i i'm not a doctor maybe that's how that works um and then and then and then, and then sue is the messiah by the way like sue sue is is the chosen one of god even though she doesn't believe in God. I really enjoyed Sue's theology today because Sue was like, well, I don't believe in God. I think that there's probably a scientific explanation for all the weird shit that's been happening on this planet. I can see that there's a force. I can see that there's weird stuff happening. I just don't believe it's God in the way that we conceive of God. I think it's just something else, an alien, a signal. And that's also what my interpretation of what is going on is. Um, so I love that, like, Sue is now hearing the voice of God, and she got, like, a message from God to save Paul, and she's like, she's, she's, maybe she's the Messiah. She's not the Messiah, she's a very naughty girl. Um... Maybe that's what's going on. But so I love that, that the chosen one, the, the prophet of God, is an atheist. I think that's wonderfully ironic and strange. She is, she is chosen, she's in the light of God, but she's an atheist. And um, I think that's cool and like very fitting of the sort of weird thematic, constant ambiguities, constant juxtapositions and contradictions around religion, God, life, death, faith, all of that stuff. And not even that's not even to mention that like father has like a a, a pal now with, with, with grandmother. The show's creator has said that um this this thing that father has brought back from ancient death, this new thing is some kind of primordial android creature. It was the thing that was here before everything else. And so I'm really excited to see what we can learn from Grandmother about the ancient past. Because there are so many mysteries about the ancient past on Kepler-22b. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. I'm also excited because I've got a slightly different uh, technical setup uh, in how I display these images. Uh, which should make it a lot easier to jump around and and know what I'm talking about. So be excited. All right. Um, Plaga in the live chat says that this was a great episode, but confusing. Yeah, it, it was all over the place. But I think we can clarify it today. So chuck your questions in the live chat and we'll figure out what's going on. Um, welcome, everyone. Lucas, ceiling fan, fat cat, Chloe, pubilus, Danny Brown. Danny Brown. We got Danny Brown in the live chat. The Danny Brown? We'll see. All right, let's talk about it. Does any of this have... What does any of this have to do with wolves, says Ceiling Fan Enthusiast? Yeah, well, they invoked the Tooth of Romulus this episode, because uh, Holly... Do you see how quickly I found that picture? This is a game changer. I can find the picture so quickly now. Uh, Holly has a relic. Uh, last season, she found a, a relic, a Mithraic religious relic from the crashed ark and it was a tooth of romulus so romulus and remus were the ancient legendary founders of rome and they lost their parents in a tragic boating accident or something and then they were raised by a literal wolf a female she-wolf suckled the baby children at her many vulpine teats vulpine lupine vulp lup 
Vulpine is foxes, isn't it? Anyway, so so that is an analogy for what's going on with Mother, because Mother is the she-wolf who raises the... Do you see how quickly I found that picture? Because Mother is the she-wolf who raised Paul and, and Campion and all the other kids on Kepler-22b. So she's the wolf. Um, Paul and Campion are like Romulus and Remus. And of course, in the legend of Romulus and Remus, uh, Romulus killed Remus... Uh, and that is like the horrific original sin, the murder at the foundations of the Roman Empire. That's how I interpret it anyway. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the uh, orthodox uh, interpretation of the whole legend is. But the point is that that Holly has this tooth, this tooth that the Mithraics say has religious significance. Interestingly, uh, Decima says, no, that's bullshit. Like these relics, they're not real religious relics. They're just these mass-produced, manufactured, fake relics. They're just merchandise, you know? They're just, like, made in China. They're just, like, used to promote the Mithraic religion in a superficial, inauthentic way. Uh, which, of course, is a real thing in the real world. Like, there are many holy relics in the real world. Uh, there are many... Um, objects that are that are claimed to have been oh this was the toenail clipping of Saint Augustus and oh this is a ham sandwich that Jesus took a bite out of but he he left the rest of the ham sandwich and here it is preserved and and, and what there is is there are a whole I mean you know locks of hair and, and tooth and bones there are all sorts of remains that people say oh this came from a holy saint and so it, it's sacred. Um, in the real world. Um, and, and one of the examples, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but one of the stories I've heard is that there are many, 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 many people who claim to have a, you know, churches and priests who claim to have a piece of the crucifix on which Jesus Christ was crucified 2,000 years ago. Um, like a scrap of wood, a little fragment of tambark, and they're like, that came... From your boy JC. Oh well, that that that's what killed JC or whatever. Um, and obviously that's you know an incredibly holy thing, the the crucifix, the crucifix of Christianity. Um, you know the blood of Christ is in this thing. This is humanity's salvation. But here's the thing: if you collected all of the individual pieces of wood that people say are from the crucifix of Jesus Christ, if you brought all of those little fragments of the true crucifix of Christ together, you would have enough wood for like 10 crucifixes. <laughs> There's no way that they're all real. There's no way. Maybe one of those pieces of Tambach really was from Jesus' crucifix. Maybe. We can hardly prove otherwise. But but it's impossible to know which relics are real and what aren't. And what does real even mean? And this is something that I think that the Raised by Wolves episode sort of gets at. Like, what does it actually mean for something to be real and authentic in, in the case of a religion? Like, is religion really about, oh, this, you know, this tooth actually came from the actual guy Romulus years ago? Or is religion more about what you believe it's about. Holly believes that the tooth has significance, and so it does. It has faith and it has meaning for her, and maybe that's the point of religion. Like, if the if if religion makes real claims about historical accuracy and, you know, literal truth, it's sort of a losing battle for religion, if we're being honest. There's 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 not a lot of uh historical, scientific, uh, factual, observable fact to be found in a lot of religious teachings and religious scriptures, but there are a lot of helpful ideas and thoughts and feelings and, and things around which you can build a community and things around you, around which you can build, you know, motivations and consolation, and, and, and that is what Sue finds, and that's why this atheist becomes a religious believer, because, you know, in her time of need, where is it? Alright, maybe my system is not that great. In a, in a time of need, Sue turns to the Mithraic religion. She has spent years of her life fighting against the Mithraic as an atheist soldier. But here she prays, because there is nothing else she can do. Um, and another point on the whole sort of religion thing that I found interesting um, was when Marcus was about to be captured... Um, because Father and Lucius went on a mission to come and capture Marcus because he's dangerous. Um, and Holly... And Marcus was, like, unafraid. 
Marcus said that, like, you know, I'm not afraid of you capturing me and killing me uh, because I'm such a... Because I'm the chosen one of God and God will protect me. Marcus... Fuck, where, where is it? Yeah, here we are. Marcus says... God will protect me, and therefore I'm not afraid of getting killed by Lucius and whatever. And after Marcus says, God will protect me, uh, Holly is the one who jumps in front to save him. Don't, don't shoot, he's the prophet. Marcus says, God will save me, and then who saves him? Holly. Holly, the religious believer, is the one who saves Marcus. And I think what that shows is that, you know, when we believe in God, God isn't the one who intervenes. People who believe are the ones who intervene. You know, like, the reality of religion comes from the actions that people take because of their religious beliefs. Um, so, like, there might not be a dude pulling the strings from the clouds, but, like, the religious beliefs that we have have measurable impacts on the world through the choices that we make and through the feelings that we have. Um, and, you know, maybe that's like a fucking soft cock postmodern, you know, put, put it in a bottle and sell it kind of religion, spirituality. But, like, I think that is a conception of religion that makes sense. And I think that is part of what Raised by Wolves is flirting with. That said, um, Mary does hear a literal real voice from God that gives her visions that help her save her son. So that's a thing. Um, and of course, we know that there is a entity on Kepler twenty two B doing some weird supernatural stuff. There absolutely is supernatural shenanigans afoot on uh, Kepler twenty two B. I think that and and Sue thinks that it's not a god; it is some kind of alien. It's some kind of technological thing. There's some kind of scientific explanation for this, and like that's a reasonable thing to think. Um, in this extremely strange bit, when Marcus found a, a creature, uh, in a tunnel, oh boy, that's a good face, um, he finds this weird creature, and the creature is, like, brought back to life by the tooth that Marcus took from Holly, like, the, the holy relic, Marcus takes, Marcus takes it from her, um, yeah, here we are, hold on, yeah, the, the, oh, god damn it, when does it? Where is it? Where's the bit where he drops the tooth? Well, there's a bit where Marcus drops the tooth of... Ro yeah, there you go. The tooth starts glowing, and there's a static buzz. And then, like, some... Then he, like, throws it at the corpse, and so so something happens with the tooth, and then the tooth causes this, like, weird, dead, desiccated, degenerated human corpse, and it, like, comes back to life. Yeah, see, see there's, like, that nano nanobot stuff coming out it's a bit like the nanobot stuff that came out of uh mouse when the bio weapon came out and like cocooned paul um so, so the point is that you know like it's not necessarily supernatural forces that are at work it might be nanobots it's science it's technology um and so i think the idea is that this god soul that seems to exist on this planet might actually be a uh, ancient supercomputer like the Trust, because it does look very similar to the Trust, um, and it is sending out a, a signal to people uh, in, in order to manipulate them, in order to fulfill its goals, which seem to be related to uh, snakes. <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a snake god, is sort of my interpretation of what's happening. Um, so, yeah. Um, Lucas in the live chat says, should I watch this show? I just like Alt Swift X. Um, I, I would not recommend this show unreservedly. Like, this show is not something that everyone would enjoy. It is weird, and it is sometimes slow, and it's very caught up in, like, religion and certain kinds of, like, relationships in a way that is not going to be interesting to everyone. Um, but, you know, if, if you're down for something... If you're down for some weird sci-fi with some thoughtful ideas and some extremely silly moments, uh, then, yeah, I, I would recommend Race by Wolves. Okay, um, do you guys want to go... Let, let, let's go uh, in, in order. Let's go in order. So, um, oh, so Lucas Taylor in the live chat says that this the way that religion and God works in this show is a little bit like in A Song of Ice and Fire, where prophecy, religion, and spirituality, it worked sometimes through overt magic and other times through trickery. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, like in A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, I think the most reasonable interpretation we can draw, and George Martin has basically said this, is that there are no gods in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like there isn't like a glowing dude called R'hllor who is like pulling all the strings with the shadow magic and the fire priests and whatever. There isn't a literal drowned god at uh, the bottom of the ocean, you know, for the Ironborn. Well, maybe there is, actually. We might see some sort of Cthulhu thing, maybe, that Euron might summon from the deep. But the point is that, like, it's not its not about gods. It's more about there's forces. There are forces in this world, and these forces can be channeled and accessed in different ways. Um, and sometimes, you know, when people hear voices, when people have prophecies, when, like, people have religious experiences and prophecies... Uh, they're not actually hearing from a god, they're actually being manipulated by someone in some way. Um, people like Bloodraven and Quaith and, and uh, Marwan the Mage, maybe, send visions and send images through dreams and voices into people's minds, and what might seem to be a legitimate religious experience might actually be a manipulation by some other force that is magical and powerful, but is not what people think it is. People can be misled through what they think are religious experiences, and I think that definitely is relevant to Raised by Wolves, because I think that this entity that is sending visions to Marcus and to Paul and to now Sue um, is not what the Mithraic think he is. This is not the Mithraic god soul who loves humans and wants to give them a paradise. I think this is more of a rogue AI from millions of years ago who really loves snakes and wants to use humans and androids to birth the snakes again. And that's why Sol tricked Mother into birthing a snake last season. Anyway, um... Let's continue. So, Raised by Wolves. Um, so, the first problem at the start of the episode is that Paul has a really bad rash. Uh, it's a very <laughs> serious rash uh, that has cocooned his entire body. Um, and and Sue says that the cocoon is going to dissolve his body. It's going to turn him into a soup. And then he's going to emerge as an entirely different being. Uh, just like butterflies and caterpillars, right? Um, my understanding, and I am not a uh, caterpillarologist... Uh, but my understanding is that, like, when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, it does turn into soup. Like, it just fucking melts into its component molecules. Uh, and then it reforms into a butterfly, which is a, a totally different organism built in, in an entirely different way. Um, I suppose, in a way, a caterpillar is not even an organism. It's just an egg that wriggles. Oh, that sounds kind of gross. I'm sorry. <laughs> it wouldn't that be a great insult if you told you're not, you're not a man. You're an egg that wriggles. All right. Anyway. Um. So I yeah. So I like how Paul is basically a caterpillar that's going to emerge as a new creature, but it's not going to be a butterfly. It's going to be a lizard because we saw uh, last episode that Paul's eyes went into like reptilian lizard eyes. They're, like he was already changing into a lizard when he got cocooned. So I think. Um, that what happened is that when the Trust sent the mouse with the bioweapon to kill the child, and again, I love the sentences that I get to say when I'm talking about this show, when the Trust sent the bioweapon in the form of the mouse, uh, and when it changed Paul, I think that the soul god intervened somehow, and altered the effect of the bioweapon because like there were two people affected by the bioweapon there was paul and there was a mithraic guy the mithraic guy did not turn into a cocoon he fucking melted like he got he got disintegrated straight the fuck out of dodge paul got turned into a cocoon and i think that's because paul is the chosen one or, or, or maybe it isn't that the soul god intervened in that moment maybe it's actually that um there was already something different about Paul. Maybe there was a, a change made to Paul's body when Sol was talking to Paul. Um, the the Sol God has altered Paul, and that has caused him to react to the bioweapon in a different way and to turn into a snake. But either way, my point is that I think that Sol is trying to turn people into snakes, and that's why this happens to Paul. That's my interpretation of what's going on. But again, it's all uh, complicated. Um, and I like how, you know, I, I like how Sue's reaction um, to what's happening to Paul is, hey, this is bad, he's turning into a fucking snake. Whereas Mother is like, well, it's, you know, it's actually more of an evolution. This might be a good thing. Because, of course, you know, like, 
Sue says, hey, it's bad that he's turning into a snake because that makes him not human anymore. But of course, Mother isn't a human. So Mother does not believe that the only legitimate form of life is human life. Mother sees value in other forms of life because she is another form of life. So I think it's very logical that Mother is like, huh, Paul is changing into something inhuman. Maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> Maybe humans are not that great. The humans did ruin the earth after all. Um, and, of course, Mother has a snake baby, child number seven, the, the serpent that they have locked up in the cave. Um, and so it, it, that is another reason why it makes sense that Mother might be um, open to the idea of snake babies. Like, maybe Mother's gone, huh, you know, like, it's really difficult, like, having trying to get my snake baby to get along with my human babies. Wouldn't it be great if all my human babies just turned into snake babies as well? And then everyone is snakes. There's no problem when everybody's snake. What could go wrong? Uh, maybe that's going on in her head. Thank you for the kind donation from Pumpkinhead13, who says, Your content has cheered me up so often, so here's a small thing for you. Keep on being great. Thank you so much, Pumpkinhead13. Glad you're enjoying it. Um, uh, 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 Daniel Dunlavy in the live chat says, Curious how such high-tech people don't have at least some methodology to differentiate between supernatural and high-technology happenings. Is a necromancer magic to them? That is a great point, Daniel Dunlavy, because, yeah, like, the Mithraic see these crazy things happening and they interpret them as miracles from the god's soul. But thing is, the Mithraic are technologically sophisticated people, or at least they were when they uh, lived on Earth, because uh, it was the Mithraic who invented the necromancers. Um, I can probably pull up a neat picture of that, in fact. Um, in the official comic, look, look how quick we're pulling up pictures. We see, here it is, the creation of the necromancers by the Mithraic. Um, well, no, but here's the answer, isn't it? Because the Mithraic did not invent all of their advanced technology themselves. We, we were told in Season 1 that the Mithraic... They didn't invent the necromancers, they examined their religious texts, the ancient Mithraic scripture, and inside the scripture they found, encoded within the text, the schematics and the instructions on how to build a necromancer. It's, you know, something something, dark quantum energy something something, uh, the fifth force of energy, whatever. Uh, but the point is that the Mithraic don't actually fully understand the technology that they're using. It reminds me a bit of, like, the Imperium in Warhammer 40k, where, like, there's these tech priests who, like, worship this holy technology, but they don't actually know how it fucking works. Um, I think the Mithraic are a bit like that. Um, and also, yeah, like, the dark photon energy that, like, powers the Mithraic spaceships, I think that also comes from the uh, Mithraic scriptures and stuff. So I think I think that's your answer, um, Daniel, because I think that I think that the Mithraic kind of see all of this fancy technology as being inherently holy. The necromancers are holy to them. They are gifts from soul to them. Um, so I think that's why that everything they see that's powerful, they say, well, that comes from God. Um, yeah, and Brian Boone says the same thing in the live chat. So does Gabs. Yeah. Man, I, I love the discussion that you're that that we're having. Uh, such a nice you know, in the, in the comments. I've never seen such thoughtful, nice YouTube comments. Anyway, um, so uh, what were we talking about? We well, were talking about how Sue's a little bit concerned about her child turning into a snake, um, and Mother is more uh, uh, sanguine about about. The, the, uh, how things are proceeding. I, I love how everyone just sort of leaves Sue on her own to deal with this. <laughs> like, there's a whole bunch of people in this atheist encampment, and, like, they've said that it's a bit, like, chaotic right now since, like, Mother uh, usurped Cleaver and the Trust and has installed herself as the Queen of the Atheists, which I feel like I would have liked to have seen a bit more of the fallout of that. Like, they just sort of mentioned that, oh, yeah, Mother, you are the, the queen of the planet now. And she's like, yep. And uh, we haven't really seen the consequences. Maybe we'll see a bit more of that. Um, but I, it's funny to me that, that no one helps Sue 
except for like campion like are there other people or doctors who could look at this but yeah like you know it's fine it's fine uh we get some cool landscapes i wonder if that's a real unaltered landscape in uh south africa i think south africa is where they're filming raised by wolves uh they have this little tank shot and and cleverly they conceal behind rocks the bit where the tank would be close to the ground uh, in order to save on CGI costs. I can respect that. Um, and the Mithraic are perturbed. Uh, the seeds are in the tarantula. Because remember that the prophecy of the Mithraic is that there will be a tree of knowledge that will grow from the holy seeds and then the chosen one will lead the paradise that, that comes from that. Uh, and the seeds are in that box that Campion and Paul found, that Paul found. Uh, but then, like, Cleaver or the Trust confiscated and, like, Mother confiscated the box with the seeds and so now it's in the Tarantula. And that very important MacGuffin, I'm sure, will come back towards the end of the season uh, so that the Tree of Knowledge can grow. Um, Decima is now rethinking her relationship with Marcus. Uh, Decima believed that Marcus was the prophet, was the chosen one, and Marcus convinced Decima to murder her robot child, or to attempt to murder her robot robot child, Vril. Uh, but now Decima is realizing that Marcus is full of shit, um, and is not really the chosen one, he just had Mother's necromancer eyeballs inside of his body. Um, and so she's starting to question him. She's like saying, well, why are we, why are we going, why are we running away instead of getting the seeds and fulfilling the prophecy? And Marcus just has to sort of continue to bullshit. Um, I thought you were the prophet, Decima says. Don't you hate it when you think your boyfriend is God, but he turns out to be just a, just a dickhead with a mullet? <laughs> Don't you hate it when that happens? Um... Uh, folks in the live chat are speculating about how the Mithraic scriptures contain these technological, uh, these technological things. Um, Powerhouse G points out that in the Bhagavad Gita's, which I can't pronounce, I'm sorry. Uh, there are ancient scriptures that talk about flying ships. Uh, I love how, you know, like people talk about how in the Bible there's mention of like behemoths and leviathans and like therefore the Bible uh, is talking about dinosaurs. And, you know, in medieval times they might have interpreted that as dragons. I love how we can uh, interpret uh, scripture in uh, whatever way feels meaningful at the time and that and those are the scriptures that survive right i'm sure there are some religious scriptures that make really specific claims and predictions that are just obviously wrong and therefore in a sort of evolutionary process those scriptures don't remain popular and influential whereas the scriptures that do happen to stay relevant and meaningful whether by chance or whether by real sort of insight uh, or whether by coincidence those scriptures remain and propagate and mutate. Because religious scriptures change. Like, if you pick up your, you know, uh, uh, English Standard uh, Bible in an American bookstore, you're not reading what the Hebrews wrote uh, thousands of years ago. You're reading something that has been translated, edited, collated from a bunch of different uh, texts written at different times. Scriptures mutate like generations of organisms. And the ones that are most successful in uh, reproducing and, and continuing to remain relevant are the ones that remain today. Whereas the scriptures that fail and the religious texts that are not compelling to people die out. I suppose in that sense, a religious scripture is like a, a, a species that can evolve. Much like a boy evolving into a snake. Anyway, sorry, tangent. Um, so Decimus pissed with Marcus. Uh, Marcus insists that he is the prophet. Um, and we have that discussion about the tooth. Marcus takes Romulus's tooth from Holly, uh, which, which does turn out to be uh, relevant later on, but we'll get to that. Um, and 
I, I yeah, I like this. I like this touch. Marcus is good at playing the role of the prophet because I think like what what we don't see so much of in this episode is self doubt from Marcus. Like Marcus has lost his power. He's lost the necromancer eyes that were inside him. He no longer has that background microwave radiation of charisma that was making him really appealing to everyone, gathering his flock. Like Marcus has lost this holy power and he must inside be wondering like am i a false prophet like am i wrong fuck but i think because marcus has nothing else and because marcus's whole identity now is built around being the chosen one he he is just unable to accept the possibility that he is not the chosen one so he just continues playing the role of of the priest even though people's belief in him is waning um and of course like his flock gets murdered this episode um so marcus becomes even more disempowered as a prophet so like i wonder like can marcus continue in the role of a mithraic prophet when there's no fucking mithraic left there's no one to follow him what is a prophet without followers what is a shepherd without a flock uh what the fuck is marcus now a and maybe the answer to that maybe marcus will uh, reunite with Sue and Paul, or at least attempt to. Because again, like, you know, Marcus is a bit of a psycho murderer. I'm not sure that Sue or Paul would want to reconnect with him at this point. Although Paul sort of has been. Um, but yeah, like, who the fuck is Marcus now? Um, but, I'll, you know, I'll, he, he's continuing to play the role of, of prophet. And I think he's doing it rather well. Um, and then, uh, right, when they're, right when they need somewhere to go... Uh, they find another one of these temples, these pentagonal temples. Do you want to pull up a picture of the one from season one? Bam! There it is. whoop -a. It's a temple. It's a pentagonal block. It's a building block. It's like Duplo, but for God. Maybe that. Maybe that's what these temples are. They are just. They are just Legos for Jesus. <laughs> um, that's as plausible as anything to me. Um, and last season uh marcus found one of these things and a miracle happened there his his rival Am ambrose got fucking spontaneously combusted he, he immolated uh when marcus like sort of prayed against him and and that's where marcus started hearing the voice of soul and that's what transformed him from an atheist into a into a mithraic prophet in the first place um so so obviously this this temple is important to marcus um and uh, so they go to it and then they perform a ritual, but we'll get to that. I really, I'd, I've got things to say about that ritual, actually. Uh, Mother is searching for Holly because Holly ran off and joined the Mithraic. Don't you hate it when your kid goes off and joins a weird club? Uh, that's what that, that's what uh, Holly has done. And Mother finds this little message that basically says it's from Holly. And she's saying, uh, where's the message? Message is back here. And Holly sends a message. It's like fucking... It's like Palpatine in Star Wars. The little hollow message. And it says, uh, Hey, um, I don't want to be with mother and father anymore. Because you guys are kidnappers. You're not my real dad, says Holly. I've run off to join the circus. The snake god circus. Uh, that's what Holly says. Um, and I love the fucking brutal burn that Holly inflicts on her robot parents by, instead of calling them mother and father, she addresses them as necromancer and generic service model, which is this brutally dehumanizing way to refer to mother and father. She is rejecting their very humanity and saying all they are is the model of android that they are. Which, of course, is literally true. They are not humans. They are literally just robots. Uh, but calling them by their fucking model number is, is, is so brutal. And that happens a couple of times. People call father service model. And I think that is a great, cruel way to dehumanize people. Um, Ragnar is killing it, says T8 Magic in the live chat. Um... All right. So mother finds that message from Holly and uh, is sad that her daughter ran away. Uh, father wakes up after his little nap. I don't know why it was necessary for father to go unconscious. Actually, no, I do know why it was necessary for father to go unconscious. So last episode, um, father resurrected this grandmother android, brought it back to life from the ancient sleepless aeons of robot death 
or standby mode or whatever grandmother was in. Uh, and, and, and then like the grandmother woke up and then grandmother like burst into light or whatever. And then father went unconscious and now father is waking up again and like continues to say, Oh, Hey grandmother. And so why was it necessary for father to go unconscious and then wake up again? Um, here's my answer because remember last episode campion saw this glowing light being that looks the same as grandmother looked when grandmother appeared to father. So here's, I think the reason why father went unconscious. It was so that father could see grandmother, father loses consciousness. Grandmother goes and saves campion as this manifesting as this being of light that campion saw. And then grandmother returns to meet father does that chronology work? My point is that, like, they needed a way to... Like, the timing of the episode. I think they did some funny buggers with the timing. And they needed Grandmother to be able to sort of be in two places at once, going and saving Campion and then coming back to meet Father. And I think Father went unconscious to sort of hide that time skip. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but that's my uh, that's my theory. Lucas Taylor in the live chat says, Do we know how sentient these robots are? Yeah, well, I mean, like in a lot of stories, they started out as just robots but they gradually sort of gained uh, humanity uh one of the things that i really like uh is i think in this episode uh some of the kids say oh man maybe father really has been killed and then brought back to life too many times um which suggests that like the fact that father has been killed and then resurrected many times maybe that has changed him and maybe that has allowed him to evolve because like what is evolution if not death and then birth cyclically spiraling into alterations of our genes in order to like life and death and life and death and life and death over and over changes things evolves us um and maybe that is what's happening to father maybe the 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 deaths that he has had has contributed to his humanity like you know you can think of a robot becoming human is that a glitch Is that a break in the DNA? Is that a failure to function correctly? Or is that transcendence into humanity? You can see it as either way. Um, uh, So what were you saying? So father meets grandmother. And and the relationship between father and grandmother is complicated. um, Because in one sense, uh, father is grandmother's father. He is her creator because... He brought her back to life. He poured the skin onto her body, onto her bones, and sort of raised her up. And, you know, Father said that he he feels like Mother must feel when she creates life. Like, Father feels like he is a parent for real now. So this is a very profound moment for him. Um, but at the same time that the, the grandmother is like his child at the same time she is a grandmother she is an ancient primordial being that existed l- much longer than father did um and so father's child is older than him um which is weird that changes the relationship um and also uh, in the official raised by wolves podcast the director of this episode said that there is some attraction between father and grandmother father likes that grandmother laughs at his joke and he's sort of into her which adds another weird layer of relationship it's like father daughter it's like grandmother son it's like people who are hot for each other raised by wolves is nothing if not a series of strange and unorthodox family situations and relationships and sexual relationships um and I think this is another in, in that long list of things. Um, T8 Magic in the live chat says, Grandmother is tall. Yeah. Even with the perspective, grandmother looks very tall. Um, and so father is very excited that, that grandmother is back to life. Um, and he introduces himself as a farmer. And father is just so goddamn adorable. He's so just sort of like naive and sincere um and father is not sure what to do so his way of trying to get a reaction out of grandmother is to tell a joke because father likes to tell dad jokes because he's a goofy dad 
And he tells this joke about a black hole and a glass of milk and a cat walking into a bar. And why does the black hole have to come with us? He sucks up the energy wherever he goes. Which, I'm not sure I get the joke. Like, I get the pun with a black hole sucking up energy, but why is it a cat and a glass of milk with the black hole? Like, uh, like they needed to have a talking glass of milk for this joke. Why would you introduce a talking glass of milk into a joke when being a glass of milk is not relevant to the joke? I might be over I might be overthinking it, but I kind of hope that we get this joke come back in a different form later on. I want to understand the cat. I want to well, no, here's the reason why it's milk because it's fucking Ridley Scott who was the uh who was one of the producers on this show. And there's robot milk everywhere in this goddamn show. Maybe Ridley Scott and Aaron Kuzakowski just could not resist the opportunity to mention milk another time. Um, because it is always uh, coming up in this show. Milk, life, death, nurturing, parenthood. That's why the milk is in there. Anyway. Uh, so grandmother beeps and goes, beep, beep, beep. And father's like, ha oh, you're laughing at my joke. And, and they talked about in the official podcast that the, the, the grandmother might not have actually been laughing. Uh, this, the, these melodic tones that grandmother does, um, that might have just been her just attempting to say, beep, beep, I exist. Like, it might have been like, you know, the Windows startup sound? Like that, like grandmother was just rebooting. And father's like, oh my God, you love my joke. You appreciate me. Which shows how desperate for validation father is. Father just wants someone to appreciate him. Like, that's why he says, oh, I, I, I really like worked hard. By some degree of effort, I resurrected you. Um, father wants to be appreciated for his efforts, and that's why his relationship with, with mother is so strained, because he feels that mother does not appreciate him. Um, and, you know, even his children, he doesn't feel fully appreciated by all of his children. I mean, Vita is a sweetie with him, but, like, Holly has just told father to fuck off, you know? So father is not feeling appreciated by mother or by his children, and so he's really hopeful about this relationship with grandmother. I am not so sure if this relationship with grandmother is going to be what father wants it to be. Uh, I don't know if grandmother talks. Like, what if beep beep boop is all that is all that grandmother says? Maybe that's the only sound that she's able to make. We could actually, um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, what if what if that's the only sound that grandmother makes? What if I mean I mean grandmother is like thousands of years old, millions of years old. Grandmother is very old. Grandmother probably predates the English language. She probably operates on a different operating system than father does. Uh, maybe they can't communicate. Like I, I keep on saying that, man. I can't wait for all the exposition from grandmother. She's gonna explain all of the mysteries of this world because she came from its ancient past. I think as like the ultimate, um, <laughs> the ultimate bait and switch, it'd be hilarious if Mother just didn't speak English or any language, um, and so only through vague uh, sign language and body gestures and pictographs will she communicate anything. That would not surprise me, honestly, because yeah, Grandmother has not talked all this time, so maybe she will remain an enigma. Uh, who I'm sure will be relevant to, you know, the Tree of Knowledge and whatever. And also, like, Grandmother will be a rival to Mother, as many grandmothers have been to mothers throughout history. Um, and, you know, the fact that she's named Grandmother, which again comes from the series creator in interviews and stuff, the fact that she's called Grandmother obviously fits her into the family of Mother and Father and Grandmother. Like, it, it, it implies a connection. Um, and, uh, super, super minor spoiler, super minor spoiler warning, super minor spoiler, but in the, um, on the next episode, for the next episode of Raised by Wolves, uh, we see, uh, that Grandmother is like a necromancer. Do you want to, do you want to take a peek at that right now? We can take a peek at that right now. Um, on, on the, on the, on the next episode, um, can I do this without fucking up everything. I think I can. Okay, so here's on the next Raised by Wolves. Uh, we see that Sue is wearing the Punisher outfit that Mother wore previously, um, which is interesting. Um, and we see... 
uh, looks like the atheist society sort of gets back into some kind of order, I suppose, with Mother as the dictator, but, you know, maybe that will change. Uh, it looks like Mother is talking shit about Sue's new religion. Um, and the snake is doing snake things. There's like an, there's an android, there's a new android, or just like a service model android falling to the ground. Not sure what the fuck that's about. Um, but the thing that I was trying to find is this shot. Yeah, look at this. Whoa. So what's happening is that mother and grandmother are, like, confronting each other. Like, mother is going into, like, necromancer weapon mode to, like, rise up and face grandmother. So, of course, it's so interesting that grandmother, this ancient robot on this alien planet, is a similar thing to mother, who comes from Earth fairly recently. And, you know, we already know that, like, the necromancer technology came from the ancient Mithraic scripture. So, you know, they have shared DNA, in a sense. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see, like, will they get along? Will they be rivals? Who, you know, who is Grandmother aligned with? Like, did Grandmother work with the humans who used to live on Kepler 22b? Or did Grandmother work for the godlike entity that exists on Kepler 22b or did grandmother work for the serpents that existed on Kepler 22b we know that like the birth of serpents came from a ritual in a birthing prison we saw in a in a vision last season uh we saw this creepy ritual happening and inside this pentagonal box was an android that's an android trapped in there and then a gosh darn snake came out of the hole from the android's mouth. Um, and so we know that androids have been part of the ancient history of Kepler-22b for a long time. And they were involved in like the birth of serpents. Um, and so I wonder if grandmother is part of that. I wonder if grandmother, uh, how, she, how she fits in. Very excited to find out about all of that stuff. Anyway. Ooh, seamless transition. Um, what are we saying in the in the live chat? Thank you for the super chat from Chauncey Fatsack, who says, Grandmother's life alert is still beeping after a million years. That's right. Uh, Rothsvilly says, Someone should get Vril a pair of necromancer eyes. She is weapon of mass destruction material, too. Yeah, I am very fascinated to see what, what Vril's thing is, because, uh, oh boy, we go full Terminator with this one. Um, do, do you want to talk about her for a sec? We'll jump ahead. Um, so what happens is that the Mithraic uh, go to this temple and um, Mark... Yeah. <laughs> so, so this Mithraic woman, whose name I forget... Uh, she says, oh, we don't need to worry about being in this temple. We have our prophet Marcus to protect us from the darkness. Marcus will protect us. And then, uh, and then next minute, uh, all of them get murdered by the faceless robot Vril and Marcus, uh, does not protect them. Um, and my God, what a terrifying attack this was by Vril. I was not expecting it. That was like, it's just out of nowhere. All the murders of the Mithraic by Vril. Um, but here's my pitch. If I was uh, in charge of Raised by Wolves, this is how I would have done it. And, you know, they had budgetary constraints, so whatever. But this is what I would have liked to have seen. What if, uh, in this moment, you have all the Mithraic, they're, they're, they're standing and, and waiting above the pit, like this. Um, but instead of this one piddly little fire, I want to have a circle of fires all the way around the pit. I want the Mithraic and a circle of fires around the pit. And, you know, they're doing their chanting and whatever. But I want more dramatic lighting. I was kind of, like, I felt like the lighting was kind of, eh, uh, in, 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 on this set. I, I feel like I would love to see some, like, fiery orange light from a, bun like, a big bonfire or something. Would have been really cool. And it would have been fitting with, like, the Mithraic religion. I noticed that this fire looked CGI like this fire looked really shitty hold on yeah this is it just me or is that shit CGI maybe I'm crazy but that fire did not look good so I don't know maybe they aren't allowed to set fires in South Africa for movies uh, I don't know what's my point my point is that I would have liked to have seen these all this this like ring of fires around the Mithraic people and then like while they're chanting um the fires go out one by one because because we did see um like we see vril 
like this. See that? See that? She's like flitting past and it's like, whoa. And Decima's like, oh shit, what the fuck is that? Like, I really enjoyed this vibe. The flitting Vril and then the, uh, fuck, what was that? I would have liked to have seen more of that. What if Vril was like flitting about, putting out the fires one by one? And that has like a religious thing, right? Like if the fire is like the protective light of Sol, it would be terrifying for the Mithraic, for that for those fires to go out one by one, mysteriously put out by Vril. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, I think that would be cool. Anyway, but yeah, no, I, I did enjoy the way they did it uh, very much. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, so the context here is that Vril was uh, Decima's robot daughter. Uh, we still don't know what the backstory is, but apparently like Decima, this woman, had a human child called Vril. Uh, but then the human Vril died. Apparently Decima broke Vril's neck. I don't know why. I don't know why a mother would break her daughter's neck. I hope we find out what the story is there. Um, and then after the human Vril was dead, Decima got this robot version of Vril and programmed it to behave just like her real human daughter did. Uh, and they had like this relationship of mother and daughter, even though she was a robot. It's like in that Black Mirror episode when someone gets a replacement boyfriend after her boyfriend dies. Um, uh, and... And the thing is that Marcus convinced Decima to reject and destroy Vril, partly because Marcus doesn't trust robots, but also because Marcus is a uh, controlling, emotionally manipulative psychopath who is jealous of uh, anyone but himself getting love and power over people. Um, and for that reason, uh, Decima attempted to kill Vril, by uh, attacking her with a knife and cutting off her face. And then Vril jumped off a cliff and it seemed like she was dead, but now she comes back with a vengeance. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I like that. And, and what, you know, Vril says, I love, like, look at this shot. I love this shot when Decima thinks she's safe and then, oh fuck, she's behind me, isn't she? Uh, and then Vril, this, oh my God, like Vril sort of acts like she's chill she sort of acts like oh you're my mummy it's all okay mummy made a mistake like decima tries to salvage the situation she doesn't want to die um and then vril says all right cool we're cool but i i want to be understood i want you to know what it feels like i want to help you understand what it's like to be me so Vril, in her psychopathic, murderous um, way, is trying to put some compassion and sympathy, empathy into Decima. Decima used and abused and mistreated um, Vril because she was a robot. And, you know, robots should not be mistreated like that when, as we've seen, robots are people too in this world. Robots can have humanity, and so it was uh, evil for um, Decima to treat Vril like she did. Um, and so I think, in a way, Vril is not only, like, getting revenge for the attempted murder by her mother, I think Vril is also, like, getting revenge for all android kind. Like, we have seen throughout the show that the Mithraic have no respect for robots, and they use them as expendable equipment. Equipment. Equ equip. Equipped. Equipment. Uh, that's how that's how the French say it. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 it's cool that we get an android saying, hey, like, don't mistreat us. There's a great line from Dune. Um, Dune book three, I think. Not a spoiler. Where they say that, like... You know, having a class of oppressed people, having a class of slaves, always bites you in the ass. Because the oppressed and the slaves at the bottom of the pyramid will always eventually rebel. Like, if you are enslaving people, you can never rest easy. Because they always will um, want justice and they will want revenge. And the oppressed can easily become the oppressors. Uh, the slaves can become the slave masters, um, as 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 has happened, um, and, and so like I think that's sort of what's happening. Like we we sort of can take Vril's side that like yeah, like Decima was tried to kill her, her she her mother tried to kill her, and that's evil. 
But also Vril murdered a bunch of Mithraic who probably didn't all deserve to die. So, you know, Ra Raised by Wolves is almost too morally ambiguous. <laughs> like, the atheists are bad and the Mithraic are bad. The humans are bad and the robots are bad. Um, no one's really unambiguously good in this story, except for Father. Like, Father is probably the only unambiguously morally good person in this show, because he just wants to be appreciated, he just wants to get along with everyone, he just wants everyone to be happy, he just wants to be a good dad. Everyone else is morally complicated. Like, Sue murdered Paul's parents and pretended to be Paul's parents, Paul shot Sue, Marcus has killed a bunch of people, Mother has killed an entire arc full of people. Um, Campion... I suppose Campion hasn't done anything evil. I mean, he's just a kid, but, you know, Campion, I guess, is, is good. I guess Campion might have learned his good morals from father, maybe. Um, Moth in the live chat says, What did you think of the direction? I thought this episode was so well shot. It's the first one directed by Alex Gabasi, I think. Yeah, I think Alex Gabasi directed this episode and the next episode. He said so in the official Raised by Wolves podcast. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed the direction this episode. I'm not like a great critic of um, cinematography and stuff, um, but I did enjoy it. I mean, that shot from before where... This shot, where Decima turns around slowly and sees Vril, like, oh my god, what a great horror movie shot. Like, I found that really viscerally effective. Um, there's also this shot, like this silhouette of Sue and Paul is very beautiful. Very beautiful, with the, with the moons in the background, and they're talking about God and, and parenthood, and that's a beautiful shot. And um, this shot at the end here, with, with Sue looking up and seeing the light of God above her. I mean, it, it's the light of a fluorescent light fixture, but it's the light of God above her, which in itself is kind of like thematically fitting, right? Because Sue's whole thing is that she's saying that, yes, there is a power on this planet, but it's not a supernatural God. It is a technological, scientific thing that can be explained by science. And that is also true of this light. This light represents her divinity. This light represents God. Like, she is talking to God when she says, I will do whatever you want. But this light that we're seeing, it's its not the light of God. It's its its that fluorescent light fixture that is above her head. It's a, it's a piece of illuminated uh, uh, God. What's the metal that they put inside light bulbs? Well, it's fluoro anyway. Anyway, yeah, so I, so she is, again, like, she's looking at something as though it's God, but, but she knows it's actually just a piece of technology. That's the same way she sees God. I don't know if this is deliberate, but I think that that light is actually a beautiful metaphor for Sue's relationship to God. These are the, this is the kind of hot analysis you can get from Ultra of Dex. Um, all right, move on. Um, Lucas says, sorry if I'm being annoying. I'm not a mod, but can we talk about all that? I think we were trying to chill. What are you referring to? Oh, yeah. Current events. Yeah, we're not talking about current events right now. We're talking about Raised by Wolves. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, so Father created a Grandmother. Oh, and this is really cool as well. This is really cool as well. Um, so Father says to Grandmother, Oh, you've got a call. I thought this was just like your birthing call, but no, it's part of your design. So the word call has a few different meanings. Call, C-A-U-L is a membrane that is over the face and the body of babies, human babies, when they're born. This is a real thing, the call. It's the little takeaway bag that babies come in when they come out of a cervix. Um, little, little, little cellophane wrap for your convenience that babies come in uh, with the placenta and, and all of that. Uh, I don't know the anatomy all that well, to be honest. Uh, I wasn't there uh, for my children's births. Um, but the call is a real thing. Um, but the other meaning of call is C-O-W-L, I think. C-O-W-L. And that kind of call is like a piece of clothing that is like a hood or it goes around your neck. And come to think of it, those two words probably have a shared 
etymology, like a shared root word. They probably come from the same thing. But but I like this double meaning because this thing of a grandmother's face, it is a call, C-A-U-L, in that it was on her when she was born and it is a membrane over her face. So it is a call in that sense. Um, but it also is a call, C-O-W-L, in the sense that it's an article of clothing. Like it is just something that grandmother wears. Um, so again, it is a very strange and uncomfortable mashup of human birth anatomy with uh, li- sci-fi literal garment called literalism, um, which is what the, the, all this show is constantly doing weird shit with birth and death and life. I am shocked we have not seen a placenta yet in this show. I'm sure we will. <laughs> We're going to talk about fallopian tubes and vas deferens and, like, all... Everything you learned in uh, Sex Ed. It's all coming back. I think Raised by Wolves is just a really roundabout way to teach Sex Ed to teenagers. Here's what they should do. Here's what they should do. If I was in charge of Raised by Wolves, I would go to the school boards of every school district in America. And I would say, hey, HBO is here to provide some valuable educational biblical religious education to the kids. Kids these days, with all their TikToks and their dabs, they need some kind of relatable, hip, cool thing to teach them about God. And that's what you guys want, isn't it? All all of the school boards in America, they want God in the classroom. So we're going to put God in the classroom through the power of Raised by Wolves with mandatory screenings at every uh, high school. But here's the thing. It's actually a galaxy bla- galaxy brain 4D chess play because we say that we're bringing in biblical biblical information, but what we're actually sneaking into the classroom is sex ed, the thing that school boards try to keep out of schools. Sex education. That's what we're getting into the schools in the guise of Bible studies. See, that's 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 the leftist agenda <laughs> is to sneak the sex ed in with the religious edge. All right. Moving on. <clears throat> Daniel Dunlavy in the live chat says, They watch this in Sunday school instead of reading Genesis. Look, I would be a much better Christian if I watched Raised by Wolves in uh, in uh, Bible Sunday school instead of, the, uh, instead of the word scrambles, the Jesus word scrambles that they used to give us. The spot the difference in this page of Exodus cartoons they used to give us. Not as compelling as Raised by Wolves. Anyway, no tangents. Um, uh, Nicholas in the live chat says, I thought the Mithraic was so cool. I hate that they had to go. Yeah, I had like a real emotional reaction when we saw the Mithraic murdered one by one. Like there was the eye patch guy. There's this guy. Uh, I think his name is Bartok. Um, one by one, these Mithraic characters that we have known, if not loved all this time, uh, there's the, there's the blonde one. There there was the other blonde one at the start. Um, I I like these characters, even though like most of them don't have names. There's this one. Like we don't really know anything about most of them, but I that one is so sad that they're all dead, and it really does change things because it means that the only Mithraics left in the story are Lucius and Marcus, and they have shall we say divergent views on theology. Um, Marcus thinks he's the prophet, Lucius thinks he's full of shit, uh, and those are the only two Mithraic left, right? I mean, I guess, well, that's not true, the children. Like, Holly is a Mithraic believer, um, and Hunter is sort of a Mithraic believer, and Vita might be too young to have opinions on God, but I think the children are how the Mithraic religion will continue, and I think the Mithraic religion probably will continue in some form. Probably through Paul. Probably through Paul. Uh, Daniel says, is Lucius still alive? Yes, Lucius is still alive. I love the way they brought back Lucius. It was so goofy. Let me find it. So, like, you know, Father was on a mission to get Marcus. Um, So Father went and recruited Lucius to, like, assist him in the job. Um, And it reminded me of, yeah, here it is. It reminded me of like, you know, that like action movie cliche when like there's a guy in prison and he's like a tough guy doing hard times. And then like, you know, Sylvester Stallone comes in and says, 
Hey, bro, I'm springing you out of jail for one last mission. Back to your old tricks, huh? Just two unlikely allies. They don't trust each other, but they're going to do one last job, and then they're going to retire. It's like... It's like all those crime movies, man. Yeah, like I that was the vibe I got from this, and I and I loved it. it. It just felt so goofy. It just felt like an action movie. And then like the whole like you know the Vril sequence felt like a horror movie, and like the Sue Leech vision felt like a nightmarish alien scene. This woman, this woman here. Yeah, like I I agree with you. She is kind of an interesting character because. Can you hear me? This is the voice of Sol. We had, um, we had some technical difficulties. Yeah, alright, I think we're back. We, the internet dropped out. Um, I've got a pretty dodgy connection where I'm broadcasting from a, um, defunct Soviet space station. Um, the acoustics are pretty good here, but the internet connection is garbage. All right, we're just going to continue and pretend that nothing happened. Sorry about that, but we're back. All right, um, so what were we talking about? Uh, we were talking about grandmother's back and mother and father uh, have a conversation, which I feel like we've seen stuff like this before. Um, like, mother criticizes father for not being reliable enough, um, and father tries to defend himself, but she's not, she's not very nice. Um, and this reminds me of some similar scenes that we got last season. Like, I, I, I felt a bit of deja vu seeing this. Um, because there were similar conversations where mother has, like, criticized father and he has not felt appreciated. Oh, look how young baby Campion looked. That was only, like, a couple of years ago. They grow up so fast. Um, yeah, like, even this. Like, I feel like there have been multiple scenes that have even been shot very similarly to this where a, a similar thing was happening. I feel like mother and father's relationship is kind of in the same place where it was a season ago, you know? Like rocky in a word um i don't know it sort of feels like they're spinning the wheel here a little bit but you know i still dig it uh it, i mean it makes sense you know it, it makes sense that their relationship is strained given all of the uh stresses on their relationship um and of course you know mother is very hypocritical when she criticizes father for like you know not focusing on raising their children when, you know, mother, of course, has been off having sex with Milk God and, you know, hanging out with the serpent of, you know, dubious loyalties. Uh, so, you know, mother, I think, is being a bit hypocritical here. Anyway, um, so Paul is in the cocoon um, and the kids are worried and Sue, which is very lovely. It's always nice when, like, in a stressful time, someone's reaction is to provide support for someone else. Like, sometimes it's the people who most need support are the ones out there offering support, which is always lovely when people do that. I mean, you know, they need support as well, but, like, you know, it's nice when that's someone's instinct. When they need help, they go out and help others. And so Sue takes a moment to say, hey, Tempest, how how are you? Are you doing okay? Because uh, Tempest is pregnant with a baby that she wants to get rid of because uh, she was raped by the priest Otho. Uh, and Tempest is in a bad place because she had sorted out a family to uh, take her baby when it's born, but that family has left after Mother's <laughs> uh, coup when Mother took over the atheist settlement. Um a bunch of the atheists ran off. Which, by the way, like, I would love to know what, what is going on with them. Like, a bunch of atheists who have not spent all that long on this planet compared to the Mithraic kids. How are those random atheists, all those extras, all those nameless people? It's like on Lost. Like, there, there were, like, the, the ten named characters on the Lost Island, and then there were, like, 60 nameless extras. And it's always, like... What do those guys got going on? Uh, that's what I'm wondering about the atheists that ran off into the planet. 
Um, and yeah, we yeah we do like this is sort of our one glimpse of like what's going on in the atheist society now. Because like we saw that these marbles, these like spheres, were given to the atheists every morning to tell them what their job is today, and we see that the machine is malfunctioning and and it's sort of breaking down. So the dystopia uh, is collapsing after mothers take over, which is you know good question mark. Um, but I like that we do at least get a glimpse of what's going on with the with the thing, and it seems positive. The kids are playing with marbles. Like what could possibly be bad about that? Uh, and Hunter and Tempest have a nice conversation about their faith. Um, because, like, Tempest questions, like, Hunter, like, do you still believe in God? Do you, be do, you, do you believe that Sol will save Paul? And he says he doesn't know what he believes anymore. Um, so Hunter is starting to question his, his faith. Hunter was, like, probably the most religious of the Mithraic kids originally. Uh, but... After all the weird shit that's going on, he, he's starting to question some things. Which is nice to see some character growth with Hunter. Because Hunter struck me as, like, a bit of a D-bag in Season 1. Like, he was quite nasty to some... Like, to, he was quite nasty to Tempest, actually, at one point in Season 1. Is, I think, the main reason why I dislike him. Uh, disliked him. But now, you know, he's showing some thought and some change. And he's nice to Tempest here. Um, so, that's nice. Uh, and he was also cool with Father before the gladiatorial battle. So I guess I'm coming around on Hunter. I'm not really sure what his story direction is or is going to be. Um, maybe he'll be, like, an important figure in whatever new society gets built in the long run. There's a line in Dune um, that I like in one of the later Dune books. Not a spoiler where the uh, where a character says what's most important is that humans learn to make long-term plans and to think long-term and the most important thing in order to make long-term plans the, the key is to be able to change your mind because the universe changes circumstances change the only way that we can survive in the long run is by thinking flexibly and being able to change our mind and adapt our thinking to changing circumstances. Um, and Hunter is displaying that capacity, you know? Like, he was a faithful Mithraic person. He was like an upper class, like high status Mithraic person. And that gave him a sort of arrogance. But now he's his circumstances have changed and he is adapting his beliefs and his thinking. He is questioning his religious beliefs. He's behaving a bit differently. And so... Um, maybe he would be uh, a good part of the future society. And, and Tempest, of course, meanwhile, has been irreligious uh, ever since the priest raped her. Um, she says that she sometimes misses the feeling of believing that there's a plan, of believing that there's meaning. Um, I think there's probably a lot of irreligious people who feel that, like, it would be nice to believe that there's... A meaning and there's an afterlife and there's a plan everyone can see the appeal of that even those who don't believe that it's true uh so that's 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 quite a nice little scene a nice little humanizing characterizing moment um and then father and tempest go and discover grandmother in father's shed i love i love how the first thing hunter says is Hello. <laughs> like you you discover a mysterious ancient primordial android demigoddess in your dad's shed and your reaction is hello. <laughs> Such a funny reaction. Uh and there's a very sort of creepy moment where it's not clear if grandmother is like alive or not. It sort of feels like grandmother's going to like grab her or something. It feels kind of tense and spooky. And so Hunter runs off, but Tempest remains and uh, like a screen appears on grandmother's call and displays like a fucking ultrasound of Tempest's baby inside her body. So grandmother is able to like sense what is going on inside Tempest and is able to display it. So I guess maybe that's the function of this call. The grandmother is able to display images on it. So maybe that's how grandmother communicates. Like, maybe grandmother cannot speak with words. She only goes beep, beep, beep. But she is able to display images on her call. And maybe that's how she communicates. In fact, that's a lot like the metal cards. Um, Marcus retrieves another one of those metal cards in this tunnel. 
uh, and these metal cards are connected to like the history. Yeah, here it is. This card, this metal card that Marcus finds. There have been a few of these in the series so far, and they have these like pictograms on it. That's a pictogram of the Tree of Knowledge, I think, in the Mithraic lore. Um, and Marcus found a whole bunch of these cards in Season 1, Episode 5. Mother found a bunch of the cards in Season 1, Episode 9. Um, and then Paul burned a bunch of the cards. God told him to burn the cards, which is always suspicious. When God tells you to destroy the evidence, <laughs> when your God is trying to cover something up, maybe he's not a good God to be following. Um, I, I think that's a bit sus. God sus. You ever playing Among Us and you go, it is not I who is sus, it is not you who is sus, it is God that is sus. That's what, uh, that's how I'm feeling about Sol. Um, but before the cards get burned, Mother, uh, like, interfaces with this card, and it gives her that vision of the birthing cages and the ancient androids on this planet. So the cards contain information, and my point is that uh, I think those pictograms look kind of similar to these silvery pictograms on Grandmother's Call. So I wonder if we might learn information on her screen like a fucking Teletubby. Grandmother's like a Teletubby. You know, like the Teletubbies, they've got like TVs on their bellies and it's like, woohoo, you can watch Seinfeld on my little, on my little belly button. I think that's sort of what's happening with Grandmother. She's like, hey, you want to watch some anime punk? I think that's what Grandmother's saying. Uh, so yeah, that that is interesting and eerie and raises more questions, just like everything else in this show. Um, and it also makes me wonder, like, when's that baby gonna come out of Tempest? Like, she's been pregnant since the beginning of season one. I don't know how many how much time has passed, but she's got to be given birth soon. I, it wouldn't surprise me if Tempest gave birth, uh, like, on the series season finale of this season. Um, and I wonder what that baby's gonna be like, because there has not been a normal birth in this show yet. Like, Mother the Android grew the her children from fetuses artificially. Um, Mother birthed a serpent, a biotechnological monstrosity. Um, Paul started cocooning into a snake. Will Tempest birth a normal, healthy human baby, or will its biology get hijacked by his soul and turn into something else? That um, would not surprise me. Uh, there's a fucking bot in the live chat, and you'd think that it would be easy to block them, but YouTube is not very good. Um, anyway, um, so Tempest is pretty freaked out about seeing her baby on the face of a resurrected android, as you would. But hey, at least she's got an ultrasound now. <laughs> That's good. Uh, anyway, so she heads out and she doesn't talk about it with Hunter. Tempest keeps things to herself. Uh, she really bottles it up, does Tempest. Uh, which is why it's so nice that Sue was, like, asking her how she's going. Maybe a relationship can develop between Sue and Tempest. Maybe Sue can have, like, a mother-like relationship with Tempest. That'd be nice. Sue is sort of wanting to be a parent to Paul, and, you know, maybe she could be a, a parent figure to Tempest as well. All right, so Mother, as the new dictator of the planet comes in and interrogates Cleaver, who was previously the administrator of the atheist encampment, until Mother killed his god. And this is an interesting scene. Uh, Mother is understandably angry because Cleaver's uh, boss, the trust robot, was using Paul, sacrificing Paul to kill Marcus, and Cleaver was complicit in that. Uh, so, and he And he defends it, to his credit, despite the fear and the torture. What, what's with these fucking veins popping out on Cleaver's face. That reminds me of Marcus's dark photon energy veins, but I don't think it's the same thing. I, maybe he's just really fucking stressed out. Maybe the makeup department got a little bit too excited with this one. But yeah, uh, d despite the terrifying situation that he's in, Cleaver is... Cleaver stands by his decision. He says it was the right thing to sacrifice Paul. 
uh, to kill Marcus because it's all about the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few. That is a utilitarian uh, ethical philosophy, which is all about maximizing the most good for the most people, even if that involves sacrificing a few to help many. Uh, but Mother is not interested in an ethical debate. She is a angry mama she-wolf trying to protect her cubs or her pups or or whatever. Um, and there's this weird, like, psychic force field energy that Mother uses to hurt Cleaver, which, have we seen that before? Have we seen Mother use those sorts of things? Mother has done lots of weird things. Um, because as a necromancer, she has a wide variety of superpowers, including like heat breath and frost breath and flying and like she's she's a regular fucking Clark Kent over here. But she like tortures Cleaver. Um, and she wants to know like what is the cure for Paul. Um and Cleaver, as he said before, doesn't know. There is no cure. Um, or he doesn't know it, which shows that, you know, Mother, who is this superpowered android, uh, she's trying to help Paul and she fails. She ends up torturing Cleaver in a way that is totally useless. Meanwhile, Sue effectively solves the problem by praying and then seeing the leeches and then giving the leeches to Paul. So, you know, Mother fails to solve the problem and Sue succeeds. Uh, and I think part of the reason for that is that Mother is too caught up in her anger and her vengeance uh, against Cleaver. Um, anyway, so she like breaks Cleaver's special glasses. I think it's I think it's really cute this effect here where we see the crack. It just appears like on the screen that we're watching, and then we see that it's Cleaver's glasses, as though like the screen is Cleaver's glasses. It's it's like a cute little fourth wall breaking thing which i quite enjoy kind of silly but i like it um and mother asks whose eyes are these and it's interesting because like mother asked about this before like said that cleaver has someone else's eyes and i didn't know what the fuck she was talking about like i, th I thought that she meant that cleaver's literal eyeballs would like donated by someone else which is probably true given like which is probably possible given like the biotech they have in this series um, but by eyes, Mother is actually referring to eyeglasses, which kind of makes sense in a funny way, because like, you know, we as humans would say that, well, glasses aren't eyes, they're just something that are attached to your eyes. But like, Mother is an artificial being, like everything is just an artificial attachment to her. So to her, eyeglasses are eyes, like, like Mother's eyeballs are removable and replaceable, um, uh, just like glasses. So like to her you know, it, it is like the same thing. There is no distinction between artificial technology and natural biotech. And of course, that's one of the distinctions that Raised by Wolves is constantly playing with, like blurring the line between the natural and the artificial, the, the, the sacred and the scientific. It's all sort of blurring those distinctions, life and death. Uh, and so Mother Calling Glass's eyes, I think kind of fits that in a funny way. But anyway, she asks about you know, whose glasses they are. And Cleaver says, they're my brothers. And then he says, they're my fathers. And he says like different names. Cleaver's all fucking confused. Cleaver doesn't know what his own backstory is. Uh, and Mother says, the reason for that is that you've been reprogrammed by the trust. Uh, humans are reprogrammable just like robots are. And the trust computer that's been whispering in your ear for all of these years, like Cleaver has just been following, um, the trust's orders for so long that Cleaver has just become like a, a host to the trust's intelligence. Um, he's a puppet dancing on the trust's strings to the point where Cleaver doesn't even have his own identity anymore. He has forgotten his own human identity or, or it's been erased by the trust. Uh, like a parasite and a host, which is which is cool. I mean, I, I feel like I've heard this before. Like when she's talking about like, oh, humans can be reprogrammed just as easily as robots. Like that is, that is a line out of Westworld season three. Um, and I dig it, you know? Like I think it's a legit and interesting point to make that humans can be manipulated like machines. And, you know, I am all for being skeptical of uh, computers telling people what to do in this age of algorithms and social media. 
Um, but I don't know. I, you know, this was fine. I didn't find it super. I don't know. Whatever. It's cool. Um, and yeah, it's kind of weird. I, I'm interested in finding out like the long term implications of this. Like, okay, so like Cleaver is like a fucking empty husk of a human who is being manipulated by the trust. But now the trust is dead. So who is Cleaver now? Like Cleaver doesn't seem to know who he is anymore. Like, like he was. He was trying to, like, you know, defend the Trust's decisions and espousing the utilitarian philosophy, you know, as though the Trust is still there. So, like, does that mean that Cleaver will just sort of step into the shoes of the Trust? Like, Cleaver has become the Trust in a way? Ooh, like, what if the Trust still exists inside Cleaver? Like, not technologically, but through Cleaver's memory of the Trust. Like, through Cleaver's deep knowledge and understanding of the way the Trust thinks... Cleaver is able to think like the Trust, and that is kind of like the Trust is not dead, but is alive inside him. And that also connects to a concept in Dune, the concept of uh, possession, which is a thing. Yeah, the memory of a person is like the person being alive inside you. Maybe Cleaver has become possessed by the Trust. Ooh. I don't think that's where they're going, but it would be cool. Okay, um... Uh, they're your eyes, Cleaver, Mother says. So, you know, maybe now that Cleaver is free from the Trust's control, Cleaver is now able to see for himself. He can see clearly. He's not trapped in the Trust's dogma. He's able to be his own person now. Maybe. We hope. Um, Anon Anon says, So Raised by Wolves is like Westworld, but with marbles? Yeah, but there were marbles in Westworld as well. <laughs> Uh, the the hosts, the robots in Westworld, had marbles uh, as, like, their brains. Like, their central CPU was a marble that looked quite a bit like that. So the similarities between Raised by Wolves and Westworld continue. I, I think that partly it's because, like, show writers and creative people are having similar thoughts because, you know, they're looking at the same world that we're living in. And so people have similar, you know, Black Mirror, people have similar similar thoughts and fears about technology and about the way things are going. So it's no surprise that these themes recur and bounce off each other. Uh, so Sue is a bit stressed about the um, uh, cocoon situation, uh, and she keeps talking to this uh, little floating robot AI thing, uh, which it seems to be like Alexa um, or Siri or whatever. Um, except to talk to it, she has to go, hey, Omnisphere? Omnisphere. I think that's what she calls it. It's such a clunky name. Like, it makes, like, you want, like, Siri or Alexa makes sense because they're short and quick to say. Omnisphere is not quick to say. That's a silly name for a AI robot. Anyway, she's frustrated. She's sad. She wants to save her surrogate, surrogate son, Paul, but she's powerless She's deeply despairing, and, and she's helpless. The feeling of helplessness turns Sue to religion, and she starts to pray with rosary beads. And it makes so much sense. Like, I did not see this coming, but it makes so much sense. Because Sue is alone, confused, facing big problems that she doesn't know how to deal with. She needs guidance. She needs a plan, she needs a direction, she needs comfort, she needs reassurance, and so she turns to faith, as many people do. Like, there are scientific studies showing that in times of stress and uncertainty, after natural disasters, after the death of loved ones, um, people often become more religious or find religion in those circumstances, and so that is what's happening to Sue. And, like, Sue also, like, has no identity because, like, Sue was an atheist, and then she killed a Mithraic and took the Mithraic's face and took on the name uh, Sue instead of Mary. And and so she was, like, sort of Mithraic, but then, but then now she's with the atheists. So, like, is she an atheist? Is she a Mithraic? Is she part of Paul's family or mother's family? Like, she's, she's lost. She's adrift. Um, and so it makes perfect sense that she turns to religion, I think. Uh, so that's cool. Um... And of course, something else to note, of course, is that her, her real name is Mary. Um, and so, you know, that's worth remembering 
at the end here when uh sue becomes like the fucking messiah with the light of god above her i think she's mary mother of god is what she is like in christianity mary is the mother of jesus christ um so yeah and paul the name paul is like paul the apostle so uh, i think there are a lot of good reasons to think that mary uh, and her son Paul are like Mary and the Messiah and like Paul is like Jesus or whatever and Paul will be the chosen one of the Mithraic but I do think Campion might have something to say about that and I do expect at the end of the series uh, Paul or Campion will kill one another and then the survivor will found Rome will 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 found the new civilization that continues on anyway um, so I, I really love this like here's well you yeah, know here's Oh, is that, yeah, what I just said is actually kind of wrong. <laughs> Disregard part of what I just said, because Sue does not really turn to religion. Sue does not really turn to religion. Sue says, I know you're not a god. I know you're not a god. Uh, you're a signal sent by some alien. So Sue is not a religious believer. She is an atheist messiah. She is an atheist Mary of mother of God. Um... She thinks there's a technical scientific explanation for the supernatural events on Kepler 22b, but she turns to it anyway, which I love. It's like, God, I'm talking to you, God. I know you exist, but I don't think you're God. Like, it's it's the, it's that galaxy-brained opinion of, I believe in God, I just don't like him. I just don't trust him, which is not an unreasonable position to take, given the problem of evil. But yeah, I really enjoy this. Sue turns to, asks God for help, but she believes that God is not a supernatural being. She believes that God is a technological being, which I think is probably correct in this case. Um, so she prays for the life of Paul. Um, and, you know, ironically, like, you know, Sue the atheist is praying to God on behalf of Paul the believer, which is sort of complicated. Um, and she begs and then she falls asleep. And when she wakes up, uh, she has the... Um, fucking well she has the the dream about the leeches which we'll get to shortly we already talked about father and lucius spring and lucius from jail to go and hunt after marcus uh and we also talked about the mithraic arriving at the pentagonal temple um and what we didn't talk about was marcus going down into the pit in this cage so apparently like the function of this temple um is to lower a person or a person-sized thing uh, into the pit. And I suppose what this means is that they are lowered into the center of the planet. Uh, and of course, we saw last season that at the center of this planet is this mysterious core, which, uh, which all these pits, all these pits descend down into the core. So I, I presume that, that this cage lowering down the pit is meant to go to the fiery core as a way to commune with God, you know? Like, because I think that the core is God. Um, I think that the core is an ancient AI, like the trust, that is sending out the signals. I think that is who Sue is talking to when she's saying, hey, I, I believe you're an alien signal. Um, I, think this, I think this is what it is. Um, so, uh, as makes some sense, the Mithraic are like, well, Marcus, you're the Messiah, so you better get into the cage and talk to God. And, you know, who knows if human beings are even meant to survive this. Like, maybe it's actually androids that are meant to be lowered down there, like necromancers. I mean, I mean, the fact that it's a cage makes me think that prisoners are sent down there unwillingly. Maybe this is how, like, people are converted to the soul god. And, of course, you know, all the questions about, like, who did this and why? Like, were the ancient humans on Kepler 22b worshipping Sol, and that's why they ha built these temples in this cage? Or was it more the serpents who made this stuff to exploit the humans in order to birth more serpents, as we saw in the vision? Like, we still don't really know whose plan this is. Like, I guess we don't even know for sure if, like, you know, even if the Sol god wants snakes, we don't know if that god built these temples and these systems and these cages and things. Like, there might be a more complicated history going on. Um, T8 Magic in the live chat says, maybe it's a sacrifice. Um, yeah, yeah, may, yeah. I mean, since the dawn of time, people have been sacrificing 
goats and cows and enemy prisoners and children to God, like the Aztecs who cut out the hearts of of their people uh, with obsidian blades, and and they would dance to the sacrificial altar with joy, knowing that they after their heart is cut out, would go to God. So yeah, yeah, maybe it literally is just humans being lowered down to burn up in the fiery core as a sacrifice to God. Um, so I, I like this. I think this is cool. I think this is a cool way of tying in with the pits and the temples. And like the fact, the fact that the temple is like blasted open, you know, like this temple was not designed to be like this. This temple is not intact. And like the previous temple that we saw that was intact, it wasn't possible to get inside. And I wonder, like, you know, like presumably that other temple that we saw last season, presumably it also was built on top of a pit. Like that makes sense, doesn't it? Because this temple also had a fiery sphincter uh, that Marcus just... Marcus loves putting his orifices, putting his appendages inside the sphincters of, um, uh, temples. Um, and I think, like, the, the, the fire that came out of this sphincter that burned Ambrose, uh, and which burned a stick when he put the stick inside the sphincter, um, I think that the fire that comes out of this is because of the pit inside the temple, because the pit is connected to the core and the core is the fiery god. So I think these temples are like a very sort of literal, direct channel of connection between the surface world and the fiery core below. Um, but what's interesting is that you can't really access... Like, a, a human couldn't get inside the temple, like, when it's all closed up. It's only when it's blasted open. But here's the thing. That little fiery sphincter might be out of fit a serpent, right? Like, it's it's probably big enough for a small serpent. Um, so maybe, the, so maybe this temple is designed not for humans to commune with God, not for humans to commune with soul, but for serpents, little baby serpents to crawl into the hole and then down to God oh, and then up again. Maybe. Because it, it's very weird to me to have like a human sized cage inside a temple that is not accessible to humans while it's intact. So got, got a lot of, got a lot of questions. Um... PJ in the live chat says, please read Mesoamerican lore. Yeah, I would love to learn more about Mesoamerica. Um, Anon Anon in the live chat says, why snakes? Venom farm? Yeah, what is with all the snakes? I mean, I think the snakes are probably intelligent or were intelligent. Um, I think they were basically people. And like the vibe that I got from like the Sturges god incarnation of the soul god thing um last episode like when he sort of possessed mother and like told her that like this is your real mission like your human children were not the real mission your mission is like this child that i've put inside you and by the way the child i put inside you was a snake like the vibe that i got from that is that the snakes are the chosen people of god uh, i got the sense that god was maybe like, and when I say God, I, I think it is an AI. What I think that this AI was built by humans, uh, and then the AI, like the robots in this story, sort of became more human and sort of became able to think for itself. And it thought, you know what? Humans suck. Humans suck because they keep fighting each other and doing all this dumb shit. Uh, so maybe I'll create my own form of life that'll be better. And they'll be snakes, and they won't have all of the human weaknesses and sins. And so the AI soul god created the snakes to live on the planet. And uh, I guess the snakes kind of went a bit bad because I think they subjugated the humans, and that's why the humans like um, fled underground and and mutated into creatures and the the birthing pits. So you know, I don't think the serpents are crash hot either. But I think the serpents are, or at least were the chosen people of the soul AI. Um, so that's my best attempt at answering why snakes. Um, all right. So they came to the temple. We get some cool little inscriptions. 
those designs, they sort of geometric designs. Are, are, are they Gnostic? Are they Gnostic sort of symbols? Are they sacred shapes? Are they, are they what's this language here? Is that a real language or not? I don't know. Pictographs. I, I like how it's it's it, it's pictorial, um, just like the call on grandmother and just like on the metal cards anyway so they lower marcus down and decimus like what are you waiting for and i think that she is kind of like hoping that marcus will get fucked up because she's angry that he is a false prophet but marcus is like uh yep okay all right fine like he's got no other option his entire identity is being the prophet so he's risking everything on being the prophet and so he goes down the pit and uh this <laughs> I I don't think I don't think they have bras in space. Um, and so he goes down the pit, and he and well, all right, we'll get back to him because there's the Sue scene where we think this is happening for real, but it's actually a dream. And in her nightmare, she sees a leech. She sees a leech inside Paul's uh, uh room while he's cocooned. Um, and so she goes in to remove the leech, and so she puts on her space suit. Um, and she heads on in and she catches the leech, but then the leech disappears from the jar that she put it in, which is like, oh fuck, is this a teleporting leech? And then she finds the leech inside her helmet. What? I thought this was such a great, scary, visceral moment. I was totally on board for this. Um, and so she's like horrified and she takes off her clothes and she's trying to get the snake off, the, the, the leech off. Oh my God. Um, and, and then she turns and sees that there's leeches all over Paul. Ah, horrifying. Um, th th this felt very like sort of alien to me, very Ridley Scott. And I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I was kind of disappointed when we found out that it was just a dream. Because uh, Sue wakes up from this nightmare, um, or maybe it's more of a vision, actually. Well, yeah, actually, I, it, yeah, it wasn't a nightmare, it was a vision, it was like a hallucination. Sue really did, like, go into the room and take off her clothes and do all this stuff. Uh, it's just that the leeches weren't really there. Um, and what's going on is that the god, the entity, Sol sent Sue these visions in order to just say, hey, leeches, that's the cure. Because the way to cure Paul is with these leeches. Um, and so Sol answered Sue's prayers. Um, and of course, the real reason for that is that I don't think that Sol is a benevolent god. I think that Sol just wants to use Paul because, like, Paul heard the voice of God. Um, well, actually, but here's the other thing. If Sol, the entity wanted Paul to turn into a snake, why did he tell Sue how to prevent Paul from turning into a snake? Maybe Sol doesn't want Paul to turn into a snake? Well, that makes me question everything, because I thought that Sol's, the so Sol's goal was to make everything snakes, so why did Sol prevent Paul from turning into a snake? Maybe it was a different god, a different signal that contacted Sue, or maybe the cocoon wasn't turning Paul into the right kind of snake. Maybe Sol wants Paul to turn into a snake later rather than sooner. Because, like, Sol wants to use Paul as its tool, I think. Because, like, Sol used Marcus as a tool in Season 1, and then it discarded Marcus and moved on to Paul. I, 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 guess, I guess Sol still wants to use Paul as a human instrument for now. But then why did... Paul get turned into a snake cocoon at all? Is this to do with the trust, maybe? Because the trust was the one that sent the bioweapon that turned Paul into a snake cocoon. So maybe this is like the trust versus soul? Because I like that idea of like battling AI gods is kind of fun. I don't know. I'm I'm curious and confused as to why this happened this way. Um... T8 says that uh, Sol wants her to plant the seeds. Yeah. Well, yeah, we also heard the voice of Sol tell Sue to plant the seeds because the seeds of the tree of knowledge are like the fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, so I'll be very curious to see what happens when that goddamn tree grows. I mean, surely it's to do with 
sin and knowledge. I mean, I think there have been hints of like a dramatic twist revelation at the end of this season. And like, that's what the tree of knowledge is in, in the Garden of Eden. That's the original shock twist. Um, the snake was like, hey, eat some tasty fruit. And then uh, Eve ate it and was like, oh, fuck, shock twist. I'm naked. There's a thing called sin. We're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. We can't go back from this. We've lost our innocence. Oh, fuck. Uh, I think something similar might happen uh, at the end of this season. And I think it'll involve finding out the terrible history of Kepler 22b. Maybe they'll find out that humans were the bad guys all along on Kepler 22b. Maybe humans oppressed the snakes, and that's why the snakes had to fight back. And maybe humans are the real bad guys, not the snakes. Like, that that would make sense as a revelation at the end of the season, I think. Uh, anyway. Um, Nicholas in the live chat says, Just like George Martin in A Song of Ice and Fire, we have to think about how they write how Aaron Guzikowski, the creator of Raised by Wolves, thinks, his inspirations. I'm not good at that, but you are. That's why you have this channel. <laughs> I don't know much about Aaron Guzikowski's influences. I don't know much about Aaron Guzikowski. I, I, it'd, it'd be cool to talk to Aaron Guzikowski. I've seen Aaron Guz Guzikowski uh, do interviews on other YouTube channels. Uh, if you're watching, Aaron... If someone who knows Aaron is watching, I would love to talk to Aaron Guzikowski about Raised by Wolves because I love it and I have so many questions and I'm very curious about the creative process. Uh, send me a DM. Aaron Guzikowski would love to chat. Um, so, yeah, Sue has the leech experience and it's great. Um, and the helpful silly, uh, Siri robot says, oh, you probably just ate something weird. Uh, but then it decides that, uh, she needs a, uh, a psychiatric medication called Giddy Max 5, which is an awesome name for a antidepressant. <laughs> Giddy Max 5. It sounds, it's a good, it'd be a good name for a band or an album or something. Uh, and Sue doesn't want the drug because it'll fog her brain up. And the computer replies that, well, your mental illness also fogs you up, which is a pretty good argument for, uh, psychiatric medication, isn't it? Like there are people who have worries and are reluctant to take psychiatric medication because of the side effects. Uh, and there are some good reasons to be, to, you know, think about that. But also, like, if you're taking psychiatric meds, you're taking them to address a problem that is already a problem for your mind. So, uh, you already, you're already fogged, you might as well be on the medicine, is the argument there, I suppose. So it's interesting to see that in Race by Wolves. Um, and Sue argues that it makes no sense for her to be freaking out of a trauma right now because she grew up in the war in heaven, the terrible war between the atheists and the Mithraic on Earth. She has been living through hard shit for decades. So why does she only break now? You know, so that, that, that's an interesting argument. I saw insane shit every fucking day and I never hallucinated. I love Sue's anger here. As though you can defeat mental illness with facts and logic. Checkmate, uh, PTSD. I will argue you away. Wouldn't it be nice if that worked? Uh, so Sue gets angry uh, about her mental state. And also, like, I, I immediately want to see, like, a prequel show about Marcus and Sue's adventures as atheist soldiers fighting necromancers, seeing weird technology in the apocalyptic earth, seeing insane shit every day. I would love to see that show. Um, and so... Sue describes the leeches that she saw in her hallucination and realizes they are a real species of leech that exist on the planet. And Sue realizes, oh, that wasn't just a crazy hallucination. That was a vision from the soul god entity uh, to help me cure Paul. These leeches will cure Paul. So she goes out to the seaside for a little bit of a beach holiday with Campion uh, and they lure a aquatic creature onto the land um and this creature is pretty horrifying looking and by the way these descend from human beings we found out last season that these creatures 
are quote unquote devolved humans. Uh, it seems that something caused them to change into this animalistic form instead of uh, normal humans, uh, which we learn a bit more about uh, when Marcus is down the hole because we see devolution happen in real time when the tooth of Romulus does some sort of skullduggery uh, that makes this creature that looks kind of human uh, change. It gets up and it falls on all fours. It changes from like sort of human-like into an animalistic creature. So like we have seen this happen. And like, you know, like, like the whole word devolution, like a lot of people have complained that, you know, devolution isn't a thing. Like in the real world, evolution is about organisms changing to adapt to their environment. Um, evolution doesn't have a direction. Like we like to think of ourselves as being like the pinnacle of evolution in some sort of linear ladder or pyramid of accomplishment. We are the best and everything below us is a lesser life forms. Um, which is very anthropocentric of us because, you know, the way evolution works, to my ill-educated understanding, is that it's it's not about being better. It's about whatever will survive and reproduce in a given environment. Um, and so this whole notion of, like, these humans devolving into, like, these animalistic creatures it doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it could be that they, you know, evolved into different creatures who are better suited to their environment if they're living these weird subterranean scavenger lives. Um, you could call that devolution in the sense that they are becoming less human and we apply like a value judgment. We value humanity. And so anything that changes from human to less human is devolving. Um, it makes an intuitive sense, if not a evolutionary sense, I guess is the point. Whatever. Anyway, the point is, we see a fishy boy, and they hit the fishy boy in the head with a rock, and, and then they throw a nang at it. Uh, <laughs> it's it's like Pokemon, right? You you got to beat up the creature, then you throw a Pokeball. So so they throw a they throw a, a nang to lure the creature, little gas canister. Uh, and then once it's all, oh, this is a bit weird, uh, Campion hits it in the head. Well, no, that's, sorry, that's not what happens at all. They, they, they knock it out with the gas canister, and then Campion hits it with a rock later when it wakes up. Um, which, yeah, is basically Pokemon. Because you throw rocks at Pokemon sometimes, right? So it's all, it's all, it's all about catching them all. Um, so anyway, they incapacitate the creature. Sue goes and cuts the leeches off it which is probably not what she was expecting to do with her Thursday. Uh, but she extracts the leeches, and then the creature wakes up. And I love Sue's reaction to this. Like, Sue is extracting leeches from a creature that, by the way, just crawled out of an acidic ocean. So I feel like Sue should probably be being burned by the acid on right now on the creature's body. Um, but, oh, and by the way, these creatures are probably what killed those Mithraic a few episodes back, like, pulled the Mithraic into the acid water inside the shed. Uh, it was probably these guys responsible. I'm not... Well, except I'm not sure if they're big enough to be responsible. I still hold out hope for an ancient acid serpent in the acid lake being responsible for that. But anyway, so the serpent's like, Nani? What the fuck are you doing? I need those leeches. I, they are my friends. Uh, and so the, so the serpent goes, whoop! Um, and, and then look at, I love Sue's fucking combat role. Look at, look at this shit. The creature's like, nanny the fuck? And then Sue, it goes, whoa, backwards, somersault. What a fucking move. Is that a stunt double? Or is that the actress doing the move? It's pretty, it's a pretty cool move. I feel like that would hurt your back a lot if she was actually on rocks. Maybe it's some sort of green screen situation. Not sure how they did that. Maybe that's... That looks a bit weird, doesn't it? Maybe that is CGI. I don't know, but it's a very cool move and I love it. And then she goes into like fucking attack mode. She's about to go Insanio style on this creature's ass. Her immediate reaction is to get into like this combat crouch. And then, you know what she fucking does? The creature growls at her and so she growls back. Look at that shit. Look at Sue roar. That's so incredibly badass. I mean, I would run away, personally. I think running away 
would be a good idea. But she growls at it, and I love it. And I suppose, you know, maybe she's channeling some sort of maternal mama bear rage adrenaline you know because like she's fighting to protect her son it's like you hear those stories uh, i don't know if they're true about like you know mothers pulling cars off their children g getting like that maternal uh, hormonal adrenaline adrenaline super strength you know and 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 of course people do get bursts of of energy and, and and strength in moments of crisis and i just love how badass this this move is from from sue look at that Foo. Hwa. yeah love it anyway um so campion hits the creature with a rock um to scare it off and, and sue continues like on all fours she, she's really, like, speaking this creature's language, you know? Two can play at this game, you quadrupedal fuck. Anyway, so yeah, it goes back into the acid water. Uh, and, I, and yeah, I, I enjoyed that scene a lot. Uh, we can see that Campion is getting real good at the whole slingshot thing, isn't he? That, that seems like it's going to come in handy. Ah, Campion's definitely going to kill Paul with a rock, isn't he? Yeah, that's going to suck. That's going to be real sad when Campion kills Paul with a rock. Okay, just like Cain and Abel. All right, um, so they get the leeches, they apply the leeches to Paul, and that cures Paul. Nice. Not sure how that works biologically, but nice. I, w I wonder if Paul, like, has already metamorphized a bit to some extent in some ways. Like, maybe Paul is changed like w when he comes back we, we we see him looking normal so so like maybe he is just normal now I, I was looking for the serpent eyes because like paul did have serpent eyes uh, when he got cocooned but i guess he's totally back to normal now i i, I don't know I, I feel like you don't put a boy in a cocoon <laughs> And then take him out and then not have him change at all. I feel like there's got to be some kind of change here. Um, yeah. Anon Anon in the live chat says, What do these humans drink and eat if the sea is acid and the land has no vegetation? Uh, so they are in a region called the Tropical Zone. And there is vegetation here. There is fruit that is edible. The water issue... I have questions about. They have never really addressed where they're getting clean drinking water in this show. And yeah, I'm not sure how that would work when, like, all the bodies of water that we've seen are full of deadly acid. So yeah, I, I <laughs> the water supply is a big old question mark for me. Um, and so yeah, so so we, we talked about this before. Um, the myth. Well, actually, well, we didn't talk about this bit. So interestingly. Um, Marcus was lowered into the pit, but he doesn't go all the way down to the planet core. To the planet core. <laughs> Remember that prequel thing? Uh, and so, and so Marcus doesn't go all the way down to the planet core. His cage gets, like, stuck partway down the pit because there's, like, a snake skeleton lodged into the pit, which, again, supports the idea that these pits were created to enable the snakes to travel around the planet through the pits down into the core but the but the cage gets stuck and so marcus is like well i guess this is my stop uh, and he gets out of the cage he goes down this tunnel and he goes on his own little adventure but that's really interesting isn't it because it means that he's not using this cage temple ritual the way it was intended to be used like i, I think the purpose is to lower someone all the way down to the planet core which would require an extremely long chain but hey if the White Walkers are able to get a chain in Game of Thrones Season 7, Episode 6, I see no reason why the Mithraic shouldn't get a very long chain in Raised by Wolves. Uh, so yeah, Marcus goes down the tunnel, and then when he gets, up, when he gets off the cage, the, 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 the skeleton of the snake just collapses behind him, and he's like, oh, fuck, that seems unsafe. The only way back now is jumping onto the cage. Uh, but 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 yeah, I mean, so, so he's not using the cage ritual as intended, but maybe some god intervened and put that skeleton there. So maybe, like, this path is part of God's plan, you know? So Marcus goes down the tunnel, uh, and there's like a fucking landslide of bones there. Are they human bones? Do you think, do you think this was like the serpent's lair, and the serpent, like 
eight people in this tunnel and left all the people's bones here and that and that and then the serpent just died in the tunnel maybe this was the last of the serpents before they died out anyway so marcus has to like dig through yeah that looks like a creature skull because that looks like it's like a pointy skull i think yeah it's like the humanoid creatures that the serpents have been eating which is important right that tells you something about the relationship between the serpents and the creatures um, and anyway, so yeah, this is when Vril attacks. We already talked about this. Very great, scary. Look at how fucking terrifying Vril looks with her face cut off. I love it. Um, and so Vril kills the Mithraic one by one. And the director, like, mentioned in the official podcast that he, you know, he took the time to give each of the Mithraic a different death at the hands of Vril, and it's very scary and great. Um, and one person falls down the pit, and then Marcus, down in the pit, like, sees the body go, uh, uh, falling down the pit, and Marcus is like, oh god, that's, like, what the fuck is going on up there? It, it, it's a it's a great scene. Y'all should watch this show, it's a great show. Uh, so great, scary thing, and Marcus is like, well, I can't, really help with that situation so i'm gonna keep digging through the bones thank you very much please and thank you um and so you know vril and holly witness this massacre by vril um and you know this is vril's child coming back to murder her people after decima tried to murder her it is so intense and crazy and great uh not the person falls down the pit which you know that's a long fall like, this person is screaming. They are still alive, and they are falling down this pit. It's a long way to the planet core. But here's the thing. In the in last season, things that fell down the pit came back. Tally fell down a pit. She came back as a ghost. The mouse fell down the pit, and the mouse came back. So do you think these people who fell down the pit are also going to come back? That would make sense in the logic of the show. But... I don't know if these Mithraic characters are important enough. Like, this blonde Mithraic woman, she's the other, other myth- blonde Mithraic woman. Uh, we don't know anything about her, really. So, like, yes, she fell down the pit, but I-, I doubt that she'll come back, just because we don't really know who she is as a character. Um, so, I don't know. Kind of disappointing if they break the pattern of people coming back from the pit. Anyway, Vril kills the Mithraic. We already talked about it. And it's very scary, and then Holly uh, activates the cage, so it comes back up, and Marcus has to catch a ride real quick. Um, But first, Marcus has a little adventure in the tunnel. So he digs through the bones, and he finds this humanoid body within. Um, And he digs through, and he sees that it looks kind of humanish. It looks like the um, semi-human creature we saw in Season 1, Episode 10. Like, like we saw that there are human-like people or creatures living on Kepler-22b, and one of them was trying to warn Mother, saying, hey, you should not birth a serpent. Don't trust God. Don't birth serpents. Uh, and giving Mother these metal cards. It was a creature like this. Um, and it wakes up. Like, it seems like it's dead, but then it wakes up because of, like, the power of the Tooth of Romulus. So that raises questions. Like, we were told that this tooth is fake. That it's just, like, some mass-produced bullshit piece of merchandise. It's not a real holy relic. But it clearly does have some kind of technological power. Uh, So, similar to the Mithraic scriptures having technological schematics encoded within them, this religious tooth has some kind of nanobot high-tech stuff inside it because we see like this cloud come out of the tooth and and affect this creature and wake it up um so why does an ancient holy relic contain the technology to wake and then devolve a humanoid creature because that's what happens the creature turns into a animal because of what was in the tooth. So what this tells us is that Mithraic technology is the cause of the devolution of the humans on Kepler into animalistic creatures. 
Um, like, I sort of thought that it was something that happened, like, naturally over time as a result of the humans going underground to escape from the snakes on the surface. But I guess this was a deliberate technological thing that was inflicted on the humans by whoever made this technology. Um, a bit like the biotech that the Trust used that cocooned Paul and started to change Paul. Seems like a similar kind of technology. I guess it's all this, you know, dark photon stuff. Um, but it does raise the question of why did someone make a technology that turns people into animals? Uh, I guess it's somehow part of Sol's plan? I guess Sol hates humans and loves snakes, that's kind of my working hypothesis, but I, I'm not sure what this signifies. <laughs> I'm very curious. Um, Lindsay in the live chat says, The transformation is similar to a necromancer. What if that creature is an android? Yeah, I guess that creature could be an android. But, like, I don't know. Like, it looks... Oh, yeah, no, yeah, okay. You're saying that, like, this transformation looks similar to how a, tr uh, how a necromancer changes from... into, like, necromancer weapon mode. You're right, that is... Yeah, I mean, yeah, because because I, I, it's sort of like a gaseous nano cloud sort of a thing happening, like this fog, you know, like it's not a purely like biological change. It is a technological. Can you imagine how that feels? I think there's like a swarm of nano robots, like fucking rearranging every molecule in its body while it is alive and screaming. Like fuck, that looks stressful, homie. Um, but. Yeah, I... Maybe it is an android. But, like, you know, the the other creatures that we've seen were flesh and bone because the Mithraic kids ate them last season. So, like, most of these creatures that we've seen are organisms made of meat. And so I think this thing is probably also an organism made of meat. But, um, yeah, I guess what we are seeing, this is what happened to the humans on Kepler 22b. They got turned into creatures by some kind of Mithraic technology. I mean, it sort of makes me wonder, like, what if this is what Paul was becoming in that cocoon? But no, they did say specifically he's becoming a snake. So yeah, very strange, very scary. Um, and then Marcus is forced to kill the creature. Which, again, is so unfortunate because, like, at least before it devolved, we could have learned some things from that creature. But, um, alas. Still no one has given us exposition to enlighten us. I've still got hopes about Grandmother, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, President Kang says, does it have a tail before it transforms? He was lying on his back, so I don't think we can... Well, actually, no, yeah, no, we could probably, we can have a squeeze at that. I can have a look-see for you, President Kang. Uh, is that a, as opposed to President Kodos? All right, so yeah, it does stand up. So the creature... Stand... Do, does it have a tail? Oh, I don't think we can see his booty. Unfortunately. Uh, well, all right. I mean, he's wearing pants. I like his clothes, actually. It's like some ancient prehistoric clothes. They look like some pretty tight pants, actually. I don't see room for a tail. Look at that squat form. That is... That's great squat form. My god, really activating those glutes. Love it. Uh, I, I don't think he has a tail, Kang. Uh, Brian in the live chat says, No exposition, only mystery box. Yeah, I mean, I've said from the start that my fear with this show is that it will continue introducing more and more cool mysteries and not answer any of them, like Lost. Um, I feel like we have gotten some interesting tantalizing semi-answers, uh, but yeah, I don't know if we're gonna get satisfying answers, especially when the budget and the episode count of this show is being reduced. I don't know if Aaron Guzikowski is gonna be allowed to tell the full story that he planned out, so, you know, I've got... I've got hopes, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, so Marcus is forced to kill the creature, but he does get that card, that metal card that we talked about that contains information about the past. So hopefully we'll learn something there. 
And uh, Marcus's lift starts leaving, so he's got to do a mad jump. And uh, and he does it. And uh, showing some uh, great core strength, uh, he climbs up into the cage and hops on up. So this is probably not what he was expecting to happen, but I think Marcus got off easy. Because I think that if the cage went all the way to the planet core, as I think it was meant to, Marcus would have been, uh, he would have had a harder time, I think. Because Marcus, I think, is not the the chosen one. I think he's a false prophet. And he's really just bluffing his way through all this. And so it's pretty lucky that he um, was stopped by that skeleton and found that card. All right. So um, Decima is running away from her murderous robot daughter, Vril. And she abandons Holly, which is such a dick move. Like, oh my god, Decima. Like, you couldn't wait for Holly before you drove off in the tank? I mean, I suppose that just shows how terrified Decima is of Rill, but, like, Holly really gets dicked over, and I really feel bad for Holly, because her, you know, she joined this new family of Mithraic people. She rejected her old family with mother and father, uh, and then her new family got murdered by a rogue robot, which is not a great start to your day, so that sucks. Uh, and then, you know, we already talked about this lovely, terrifying scene where Vril confronts Decima and Decima and Vril punishes Decima for abusing her and trying to kill her um, and dragging her body with one hand. Like, I, the horror of this scene, I think, was done really well. I was not expecting this from Raised by Wolves, but I really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, we already talked about that stuff. Uh, Father and Lucius head off to capture Marcus. And Lucius is uh, skeptical about the change of government that's happened on this planet. Uh, what with Mother becoming queen of the planet. Um, and, you know, Father insists that they're just, you know, holding the planet until Campion grows up enough to be the king or whatever. And, you know, I think we... Any despot who says, we're going to transition to democracy soon. We're going to hand over power to someone else. You should always be skeptical of that, because historically it doesn't always work out like that. Um, I could see Mother turning into a bit of a dictator. I could see Mother going into a bit of a Daenerys Targaryen thing, you know? Uh, I don't want to see that, but I could imagine that happening. Um, and so they find the temple, and so... Actually, yeah, sorry, yeah, that is... Yeah, that is Father's priority, is to get Holly. Um, and of course... Like any parents, uh, mother and father do not respect their child's decision to leave the family and join the circus. They insist that she needs to come back home. Um, and I like this sort of, you know, buddy cop, you know, unlikely allies banter between um, Lucius and father. Like, they don't trust each other. Lucius doesn't like father but they're working together as an alliance of convenience, and so I enjoyed that. So uh, Marcus comes back up out of the pit, and he's like, Hey guys, what did I miss? What what uh, what, what what you been doing? You having a cool... Uh, are you doing marshmallows on the campfire? What are we doing here? Oh, oh we're tearing off people's faces and hanging them. Uh, oh, that, that's not what I was hoping from my picnic. You can see the disappointment on his face that there's no s'mores. Um, so that's pretty horrifying. Uh, and then Marcus comforts Holly. And again, like, I think Marcus does a good job of, like, pretending to be, like, a good prophet. Or, well, he's hugging. He's just being a nice guy, I guess, at this point. Half-decent guy. Um, and then Paul is miraculously better after those miracle leeches sucked all the serpent out of him. Uh, and he's fine, uh, and Sue gets to play mother, and Paul is, like, accepting her care. Paul was, um, a little bit, uh, uh, shooty with Sue previously, because, uh, Sue killed Paul's real parents. But they seem to be a bit more chill after Sue saved him, um, and they're, they're doing okay. And they have a theological discussion later. But the point is that Paul is fine. And it's interesting that Tempest's baby is kicking inside her womb. After Grandmother showed an image of Tempest's baby on her Teletubby face. Um, so I wonder if Grandmother has affected Tempest's baby. I wonder if that baby has been changed. 
like every other bloody baby in the series. Uh, so back at the temple, uh, Marcus and Holly look like they do a little Targaryen funeral for the Mithraic. I guess it makes sense that the Mithraic burn their dead, like Targaryens. Uh, but then Lucius and Father turn up to uh, retrieve Holly and capture Marcus. Lucius really wants to kill Marcus because Marcus lied to Lucius and impersonated a Mithraic guy who Lucius's father knew. And Lucius feels very angry about Marcus being a false prophet. And, uh, and so he's really into revenge, but father doesn't want uh, Lucius to kill Marcus in front of Holly. And I already talked about this, but I love, I love that Marcus says, Sol will protect me. And then who protects Marcus? Holly. And I think that's how religion works. You know, God acts through the behavior of God's believers. You could almost say that God exists in the minds of the believers. Alan Moore talks about how magic is real. You can't cast a spell that explodes a pumpkin, but you can use words and rituals and beliefs in a way that change human behavior and human experiences. Everything important that humans do comes from the thoughts and the feelings and the beliefs inside the human mind. And magic is the art of altering and manipulating and changing and inspiring and sparking thoughts and feelings and beliefs in the human mind through words, through images, through ritual, through vibe. That is what magic is. And I think that's that's kind of what religion is. It's about the beliefs and the impact that those beliefs have on our behavior. Uh, in that sense, magic and religion is real. And in that sense, soul protects Marcus because of Holly and Marcus's shared Mithraic faith. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Marcus miraculously survives once again, despite all of the crazy shit he's done and all of... I, I love his sort of quiet confidence. Like, he's like, yeah, I still got it. I still got it. He still wants to believe he's the chosen one. Uh, and, yeah, I guess Marcus is now a prisoner of the atheists. So I guess the atheists won the war. Like, two seasons later... The atheists have kind of won the war against the Mithraic because the only Mithraic left are Lucius and Marcus, who are now prisoners of the atheists. And I'm sure, you know, Paul will rise up to be the new Mithraic leader or something. But, you know, it's, uh, it's isn't it nice when a war ends? All right, moving on. So Sue and Paul have a little theological discussion. Uh, Sue says that she prayed, but she doesn't believe in God. Something answered her prayers, some kind of signal, the entity that was talking to Marcus and talking to Paul. Uh, and, you know, she believes that it exists, but she doesn't believe that it is God. Um, whereas Paul does believe in God. Um, he does believe that it's soul. Uh, and Paul's like, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between a God and an alien? Checkmate, atheists. Um, what is the difference between a god and an alien? I mean, a god created the universe and is in charge of the universe and has a plan for everyone. And, like, a god cares about humans. Um, an alien... An alien might not care about humans. But, I mean, an alien could play the role of a god. And that is what happens in Ridley Scott's, like, Prometheus stuff, right? Um, aliens could certainly be godlike. But yeah, look, that's a real thinker. You ever see that movie Contact? What a good movie. I want to watch Contact again. It's about aliens and godlike aliens. Um, and, you know, and Sue has sort of the rationalist perspective of saying that, well, you know, when we talk about God, we have beliefs about a thing. We make assumptions. We have faith that God is a certain thing, whereas aliens are a possibility. We don't know what aliens are. And so that is the scientific perspective. Like, the scientific perspective is not to believe in things just because you want to believe in them. It is to base your hypotheses and your understanding of the world on your observations. And you change your beliefs based on what you observe. 
And so that's what Sue has done. Sue is being a scientist. She did not believe in God, but then she heard voices and she had visions. And so she's realizing, yes, something does exist. There is something. Based on my observations, I've updated my hypothesis. Something exists. And she, one of her hypotheses is that it's an alien or it's a signal or whatever. That's, that, that is the hypothesis that best fits her observations based on what she already knows and has seen. Um, that's a scientific perspective. Whereas Paul is saying, uh, I use faith. I believe that God is a certain thing. I believe that his name is Saul and he, all the scripture is correct and he has a prophecy and a plan. That's faith. Whereas Sue bases theories on observations. That's science. Just in case, <laughs> just in case we were confused. Um... And yeah, it's interesting. Paul says that in the Mithraic religion, Saul always asks atheists to prove themselves before he helps them. And Sue says that she didn't prove himself. Um, but I feel like Sue kind of did prove herself when, you know, she was like staying by Paul's bedside and she, you know, went out and got the leeches off the creature, which I guess was after the vision. But I feel like Sue has sort of proved herself. I mean, she's survived the last two seasons of insanity, I, you know. But but then Paul interestingly says, maybe it's something different you heard. And so that sort of makes you think, is there another god at work here? Like, like what put Paul... Like, like, it doesn't make sense that god would put Paul in a cocoon and then tell Sue how to get Paul out of the cocoon. That makes no sense. So maybe there are two gods, maybe there are two voices operating here. Maybe they are soul and the trust. Maybe the trust is not dead. I don't know. Very curious. Uh, T8Magic in the live chat says, didn't they say they actually detected the signal? Good point. I think you're right. I think there was, like, in season two, episode two, or season two, episode one, Sue said, yeah, like, we have detected with scientific instrumentation a signal, and that signal is blocked out by the electromagnetic field in the in the tropical zone which is another reason to suspect that this voice is something different isn't it because that is a thing that like on this planet now um the voice of soul can't get into the tropical zone so whatever voice sue is hearing maybe it's not the same god maybe it's not the god people were hearing from before so god maybe there's a god in the temperate zone and then the god soul is everywhere else the theology is getting complicated. I I think the show is running the risk of introducing new mysteries faster than it is answering the old mysteries. Um, I feel like I need some answers here, man. You know? But we'll see what happens. Uh, and Sue and Paul agree to disagree. Like, they have different understandings of what this thing is, but they both believe that it exists. Uh, there's a line I like in The Expanse about how all I want is for humans to be able to disagree with each other and even hate each other, but not kill each other over it. And that is what we all need to do. We all need to agree to disagree. Have different beliefs, but still respect each other. And at that, they they walk off together and it looks like Paul has accepted Sue as her mother, as his mother again, which is lovely. The atheist and the Mithraic have reunited. Ain't that beautiful? What could possibly go wrong? Um, and so Paul goes to sleep. And yeah, Mary. So so Sue starts hearing the voice. And it's interesting that the voice uses Sue's real name, which is Mary. That was her name before she took on the face and the name Sue. Um, and this voice tells her to grow the seeds. Um which seems like something that Sol would say, because, like, the prophecy and the scripture of the Mithraic religion says to grow the seeds. So maybe it is Sol that's talking to Sue, not some other voice. I don't know. I'm just I'm just confused about the cocoon. I just don't know why... I don't know why Paul would turn into a snake, unless Sol did it. I... Yeah. I, I've got a lot of questions. But I'm very excited for Mary, Mother of God, to be the atheist messiah. She doesn't believe in God, but she'll do what God says, uh, which I find to be ironic and fun and strange, just like everything in this show. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to this live stream. I hope you had fun. We'll do another one next week. Uh, thank you to everybody for the super chats and things. 
Uh, thanks for everyone in the live chat. Uh, Matthew, Bill, TH, Chauncey, PJ, Chad. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're going to close it up now. Hope you enjoyed. Sorry about the technical difficulty we had in the middle there. And uh, see you next time. Cheers. Stay swifty. Oh, uh, Mariella in the live chat says, where are the podcasts for each episode? I cannot find them anywhere. So these Raised by Wolves live streams, we are not releasing them as audio podcasts because these are very visual, right? Like I'm talking a lot about the pictures on the screen. Um, So I feel like it wouldn't make sense to listen to this as a podcast. Although, you know, it is two hours long, I guess it probably would make sense to listen to it as an audio podcast. But, like, the Old Shrift X podcast is mostly for Game of Thrones Abridged, the Game of Thrones Abridged podcast, which is going to get a new episode soon-ish. Um, so that's why I didn't add the Raised by Wolves live streams to the ga- to the Old Shrift X podcast. But, I don't know, maybe maybe I should. Do you guys want the... Oh, you're talking about the official podcast. Oh, sorry. Uh, the official Raised by Wolves podcast. Um, well, I haven't got the link, but um, it is out there. If you search for the Raised by Wolves podcast on Spotify or your podcast app, you'll find it. Um, y'all are talking about Elden Ring. I will play Elden Ring on the Alt Swift X gaming channel. Uh link in the description i hope to you you, you, can, you can find it alt shift x games and uh yeah i will play elden ring uh it won't be tomorrow but it will be soonish i think uh and i'm really looking forward to it i didn't manage to play all of dark souls and bloodborne and sekiro before <laughs> before elden ring came out unfortunately uh, I have limited experience with those games, um, but I am excited to try Elden Ring because it was created with some writing contributions from George R. R. Martin, our good friend George, the famous author of Wild Cards, um, and the executive producer of Night of the Cooters, uh, and... Oh, and also, he, he, yeah, he also happens to be the creator of A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones, but, you know. Who even has heard of that? All right, anyway, we're, we're, we're stopping. Thank you for listening, and see you next time. Cheers.